Welcome to series 50, everyone. Goodness. 50 series. We've done 50 of these. <laughs> 50 of these. Oh, uh, boy. That's over 50 months of work on this podcast. Yeah. Uh, which is just mind boggling. Yeah, it's um, it like it's good. It's yep. good that we've done 50 of these, but also like when what? Where did the time come from? When or did go? that happen? Like, yeah, I, I'm still in shock that it's been four years. Like, yeah, I feel like I don't like was there a time in my life when I wasn't doing this? Like also, <laughs> also, it's still very new. You know, I don't know. Yeah. It just oh. it's, it's wild how long four years feels and how short it feels at the same time. Right. I mean, and I don't know how much of that is the fact that the last two years have been a lifetime. Yeah. But <laughs> it's hard to say. <laughs> That's fair. Like somehow um, we've been keeping it, it going uh, throughout this whole thing. And yeah, uh, I mean, we had to like good. cut back a little bit because um, because the pandemic's been a lot. We're like working from home. I was I was homeschooling my kids for most of last year. Yeah. I fell down some stairs. I, mm -hmm. uh, you know, had a lot of health issues last year. Oh, yeah. So um, but the fact that we've we've managed to keep three out of four yep. <laughs> every month still feels pretty good. Exactly. Um, and I still hold that hope, like, dear listeners, um, we really do want to get our Evolution Cast episodes back up. It just, they require a lot more planning and effort than... So much more, yeah. ...the other uh, episodes. Mm -hmm. And it's a whole other day of recording, too. So it doubles our, I mean, not doubles, but, like, it doubles our number of days we spend recording. Yeah, exactly. So, um, yeah, but I'm still, I'm still really proud of what we have, like, mm -hmm. after 50 series. It's, it's great. It's great. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, I'm really excited because this month uh, we've got uh, uh, the folks from Kill Every Monster yes. joining us, uh, Dylan and Aram. Um, and we're making some some really uh, bespoke uh, D and D five E compatible characters. Yeah, I'm uh, really <laughs> excited about this because we in series one we covered D and D, and so we wanted to do something cool for series fifty because fifty is like a cool, exciting number. It's a big yeah. deal. Um, but it's been a long time since we visited D and D, mm -hmm. and there's a lot of stuff out there. We talk about D and D all the time, so we decided to sit down and make D and D characters using almost anything except D and D. Yeah. Um, and. It shows. <laughs> we had a great time. We had a great time. We, uh, um, it was it was so much fun. Um, but wow, uh, it, you're in for a treat, everyone. Yeah, I I apologize if if the episodes for this series, at least these first two episodes, are a little long, um, because we recorded for five hours somehow. Yeah. Uh, just for the first two episodes. Yeah. Um. And and I'm pretty sure an hour and a half of that is unusable, like not even for outtakes. So, <laughs> right. Well, <laughs> look. <laughs> yeah, there was so, some content. There was a lot of content, um, but uh, we'll we'll see. Some of those outtakes might make it up somewhere. Um, I know uh, Aram and, and Dylan said they might take some of the stuff that we can't use on uh, our show. Uh, and, and put it up on for bonus content for themselves. Uh, so we'll see uh, yeah. what comes of that. Um, but yeah, we've got that. We've got uh, Q&A episodes coming up later this month mm -hmm. uh, after the series. Uh, we've got so an actual play coming. We've got all kinds of stuff. Actual, we've got all actual kinds play. of stuff. So we'll, we'll quiet down a little bit so we can get to the announcements. Um, so uh, we aren't here forever. Uh, so you can yeah. find out about some of these cool things going on. Yeah. So first, as Ryan mentioned, we have our Q&A episode coming up. Um, mm -hmm. We are going to release that after Series 50. There are five Mondays in May. So normally we would have two weeks off, but our hope is that we can release our Q&A episodes. Um, we have a bunch of questions, so we're going to probably split it up into two episodes. Mm -hmm. um, and then you'll have something every single Monday in May. Wouldn't yeah. that be great? That would be great. That said... Um, this is probably your last chance this round to get your questions in. We've had quite a few already, um, but we really want yours too. We really mm -hmm. want uh, as many questions as we possibly can. So if you have any pressing questions for us about character creation, about ourselves, about uh, 
what we like in games, about game design, really anything. Um, you know, what we like to dip in ranch um, or not, <laughs> if you're Ryan. Um, <laughs> please feel free to ask. Uh, we, I don't know, we love answering these kinds of questions. It's great. Mm -hmm. So um, you can submit your questions at questions.charactercreationcast.com and we will try our best to answer them. Absolutely. Uh, next up, uh, we've got some uh, bonus content coming to the One Shot Network Secret Archive for Patreon subscribers at the $5 and up level. Uh, it may actually be there already. Uh, we're recording this cold open uh, the Tuesday prior to the release of this episode. Um, so if it's there, uh, check it out. We'll have it in our show notes. Uh, for this, we stumbled through the, the base creation rules uh, for, for Marvel superheroes. I feel like stumbled is putting it generously. <laughs> we just start over like three times because I kept getting too frustrated. We did. Uh, <laughs> there, there were some good nuggets that I was able to pull out of that frustration um, and okay. that made it into the, the episode. But uh, goodness gracious, uh, uh, it was an ordeal. Mm -hmm. uh, we did figure out what China pattern we had. Well, which uh, is clearly the most important part of that game. Exactly. So I'm really happy that we were able to do that. Um, and honestly, once we figured out a system, it, it was it was a lot of fun. So yeah. uh, was it, it the it, right one? We don't know. <laughs> exactly. <so. laughs> Who can say? <laughs> I mean, uh, for, for listeners that uh, enjoy the Marvel superheroes game and, and enjoy and have used correctly the, the base <laughs> building mechanics uh, for Marvel superheroes, um, you know, uh, you can add us after listening uh, and let us know uh, how how off we were from. <laughs> yeah. So here's the thing. We said it in the episode. And we can say it here now, too, is that, like, please don't at us to tell us we're wrong. Yeah. We are well aware. <laughs> so oh, aware. we know. So we aware. know. Um, but we are interested in knowing exactly how uh -huh. wrong we are. Exactly. And where we're wrong. So exactly. if you do know how the base building mechanics work in Marvel, please, uh, can, please tell us. Exactly. <laughs> if you know the rules, I guess, please, please help. <laughs> please let us know, because right, we tried so hard. <laughs> We've been, been losing sleep trying to figure it out. Like, <laughs> lay awake at night. Do you think maybe we both roll on the table? No, that no, can't be right. That can't be okay. right. What's happening here? <laughs> um... <laughs> But uh, yeah. def definitely hit us up on Twitter or you can even hit us up on Discord at discord.charactercreationcast.com. And uh, we'd love to be proven uh, how wrong we were. Yeah, absolutely. Like, like I said, I just want to know, like, why we're wrong. Yeah, Not exactly. that we are. We know. But I just want to <laughs> know why. Uh-huh. <laughs> um, other ways that you can support us uh, would be by leaving a rating or review on your podcatcher of choice. Um, cause we don't have any more mm -hmm. Apple podcasts is the most impactful. It's the one that people see and that, you know, comes up when you Google things. Um, there are not a ton of places to leave podcast reviews, so you can check out, uh, Podchaser, Podcast Addict, Facebook. Um, but if you happen to leave them anywhere that isn't one of those places, please let us know and we will go dig it up so that we can read it. Mm -hmm. Um, we really like reading them, so... Please leave them and um, t tell us where, you know, everyone, this really <laughs> is cold open. Like, please tell us how podcast, <laughs> how do game, how, how, how read. How, how good podcast, um, how, how, how read podcast good. <laughs> sometimes, <laughs> sometimes your 50 series is, is in and it's just too much, you know? It's, it's fine. It's too much in a good way. And uh, honestly... Uh, if I'm if I'm gonna lose my mind doing a project, uh, it's it's fun to lose my mind uh, with you, Amelia. So yeah, I mean, same. It's like if this is you know one of those like if this is how I'm gonna go, that's not so bad. That's not so bad. <laughs> uh, oh, here we get a drum roll for the for the most important announcement, everyone. Oh yes, there you go. Uh, picks up on the mic. Uh, finger snaps. One last announcement. Um, hey, my new studio is all set. Woo! I Yay! know. <laughs> so I, I, I got the sound panels up on the wall. I've got the ceiling panels hanging from the ceiling. Um, and it, it's virtually like eliminated my my reverb. 
You um, sound so and, different. No, actually, you do. Actually, I can I can tell. Right? Um, yeah, even Amelia can tell. Even that. Amelia. <laughs> It's a big, no, it was, it was wild because I, I took, uh, four different snapshots of my soundscape in here. Right. Mm -hmm. And like from no panels to panels, just laying against the walls to panels, partially installed to everything fully installed. Right. Yeah. And like, and, and then I, I did some the most basic, like sound cleaning I could think of. And it was just a stark contrast between all yeah. of them and then this one was just like wow it sounds like i'm in a studio yeah it's just i can tell like there's not as much reverb for sure yeah. um it's yeah it's noticeable so it, it makes me happy so yeah. and i'm uh, happy for you yeah uh if you want to see on my twitter at lord neptune you can see uh some pictures that i posted on there uh if you're yeah, on the creation on cast discord. discord yep yep uh, check them out because uh, this thing is a, a thing of beauty. I've got my art on the walls. Uh, it's pretty nice. Yeah. No, I'm really excited and uh, I'm, I'm looking forward to uh, uh, future recordings in here. And I think it'll be uh, really nice to, to, to have this space. Mm -hmm. um, and and, uh, and soon, get a table in there. Get a table in here. Uh, I got plenty of room for a table, a couple chairs, uh, and then maybe you can visit and we can yeah. record something cool in person. Find some cool two-player games. And Heck yeah. Try them out. I'm sure yeah. there's quite a few of them out there. I don't <laughs> there's, a, there's a whole podcast. There's, yeah, right. <laughs> okay, well, all of that, that is it for announcements. Believe it or mm. not, that's all, you know, that's all we have. That's all we have. <laughs> just that. <laughs> just that. <laughs> Join us after the episode for our calls to action and our reactions to this episode. <laughs> uh, for now, enjoy the show. Welcome to Character Creation Cast, a show where we discuss and create characters, the best part of role-playing games, with guests using their favorite system. I'm one of your hosts, Ryan, and this episode, my co-host Amelia and I are excited to welcome Dylan and Aram, the hosts of Kill Every Monster, a podcast covering the monsters of D&D. Welcome to Character Creation Cast. I'm really excited that you're here. I'm, oh, I'm yeah. so excited for this. Thank you for having <laughs> us. We're excited to be here. We're slowly bringing together all the aspects of playing a game of D&D. We got yes. characters, we got yep. monsters. I know some folks who do the magic podcasts. Yeah, there you go. Yeah, the there are world building day. people. Yep. Like eventually, eventually, eventually all we will have. Whole D &D. We'll take it over. Yes, we are the <laughs> Avengers. Of We're coming for you, Hasbro. <laughs> <laughs> um, Dylan, can you tell us a little bit more about yourself, the kind of projects you have going on and where people can find you online? Sure. Uh, just one piece at a time yeah, no no <laughs> i'm you're just reminding me of projects uh oh, no. so i am a i am a grad student so all of my projects are boring and hard but also i do kill every monster uh where we as mentioned have some guests on and let them talk about their favorite monsters and how D, &D sometimes just doesn't quite nail the design have a lot of fun with that one uh you can find me on twitter at dj malinfont and Aram, how about yourself? And my name is Aram. You can find me on Twitter at Aram Avartian. I am the creator of God's Fall and the co-producer of Kill Every Monster and also the editor of Total Party A Throat, which is a podcast I enjoy a lot. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And Dylan and I have like uh, just, you know, like I forced him to do this during the pandemic and because it was the pandemic, he was bored enough that he agreed. And now here <laughs> we are. Yep. It is in phenomenal. A, in uh, one small moment of a lapse of judgment. <laughs> one, in one small moment of a full year of staring at a blank wall. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. Yep. I was better than uh, I was better than the abyss. That's yeah. what I like to say. <laughs> Congratulations. <laughs> Thank you. Seemed. 
Oh. You seemed better than the abyss. <laughs> oh no! <laughs> uh, I do want to give all of our listeners a quick note about this series. Um, our questions are going to sound a little bit different from our usual boring right. list that we ask over and over again every time about every single game. Uh, because we covered this game back in series one. So if you want to hear about basic rules as written D&D, you can go back to series one. Um, this one, we are going to focus on the variety of supplements and variants and all of that that you can do. So we're going to ask questions about what the system can do and what it can't. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, so let's go ahead and get into this. Uh, we're going to be start by discussing what this game is all about. What's in a game? All right. So rather than asking what the what the core concept of D&D is uh, generally, uh, especially with how well known the game is, uh, what makes something D&D uh, for you specific? So here's what makes something D&D for me. And it's I don't know if it's because of how D&D works or because D&D came first and video games came after it and D&D and &D was a template. But when I play D&D, it feels like an analog video game. It yeah. feels like an analog fantasy video game. And no other role-playing game really feels that way, probably because those video games are built off how D&D works. Mm -hmm. But when you get a group of people who have only played those fantasy video games and you sit them down for the first time and you DM for them, and all of a sudden they get to that first dialogue tree and there's no tree. They can just talk. They can ask whatever they want. You can watch the light bulbs go off mm -hmm. in a pretty unique way because mm -hmm. it's such a direct path from what they were doing. And to me, that's what makes D&D special. Yeah, mm. I think that's actually a lot of people talk about the fact that D&D &D is treated like an entry point, which from a, you know, no other background perspective is a bad idea. It's three books long. The books are fairly convoluted. It's not really that straightforward to learn There's how to run so the game many games from with the easier baseline. Rules. Yeah. yeah. So <laughs> many. But as Saran mentioned, because it's the template, it's actually easy to slot yourself into it because though the mechanics are a little bit more of a pain to learn, you sort of already know them from just a cultural osmosis. Mm -hmm. So the only thing you're really introducing people to is that creativity aspect. Yeah, I think that makes a lot of sense because it's there. You already have all of the touch points yeah. for like, I here's, know you know, here's how like levels work and classes. And yeah. yeah, and the DM's still doing the math for him. So the yeah. computer is still running for right. them. It's not that much of a shift for what they're doing. Mm -hmm. It's just you just you're just basically freeing them up. You're just yeah. saying, OK, I'm now I'm taking off all the blockers you were facing before that mm -hmm. you didn't even realize were holding you back from all this story. Right. I right. will say Absolutely. one of the major defining features for D&D &D, for me, though, is labor asymmetry. Like there are a lot of games that put different kinds of work on the players versus the DM. Mm -hmm. But D&D &D is a game that assumes the DM is going to do a lot more work. Yep. Oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. And like so nine times out of ten, if I'm running a game where it's going to be fantasy based and the players are slotting into just a world and I'm going to tell a story based on their actions and I'm going to do all the work. That's what D&D is for. Yep. Yeah. D&D is definitely where that, um, like that power balance comes from. Right. Yeah. This idea mm -hmm. that, like, that I hate. Um, that great. you just, as a player, just show up and a game happens at you and it's great. Mm -hmm. um, and I don't like that, but D&D &D really is set up for yeah. that. It's, you know, mm -hmm. the DM does all of the work of the world building and the stats for the monsters. It's the birthplace and the, you know. of the DM screen. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Bad idea. But, stop using screens. Stop hiding information from your players. Yep. <laughs> don't roll if you don't want the answer to be random. If you don't want it, if you don't want the answer, don't roll. Only right. roll when you want it. Yeah. 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 And if nothing's going to happen, don't, don't make other people roll. Don't yeah. roll. Yeah. Yeah. Because there's nothing worse than rolling and being like, no, you find nothing. Yeah. <laughs> like, you didn't wait, hear it. Mm -hmm. So what? now you're in the exact same situation and nothing has changed. Right. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Come like, on. Oh, that's a bummer. But, yeah. but you do know something was up because right. there was right. a roll that made. But now you have to pretend you're not suspicious for no yep. reason. That, that right. weird video game thing is what creates that that problem of metagaming. Metagaming yeah. is not a problem if everyone is on the same page. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Exactly. 
Yeah, it's but not a dirty word. A, so, yeah. <laughs> but that metagaming where it's like, hold on, now you've told the players there's a problem and then followed it up by telling them, and there's no way you can ever deal with it. Right, exactly. Yep, like D&D oh. is a game with like three buttons, and if you've already pressed them all and you know there's a problem, sorry, bud, you pressed all your buttons. Yep. That's where Wait you use Eleanor's strategy where she told me, uh, did you know that if you're in a game and you're losing, you can just turn it off? That's some gamer strats for you. 100%. That's good strategy. <laughs> I was like, great, you just quit. Yep. <laughs> Problem solved. <laughs> yeah, it is interesting that the whole idea of just playing games when they're fun, and if they're not fun, don't anymore. What a novel Whoa. concept. I'm sorry. <laughs> I don't understand. <laughs> Let me try one more time. So we're not going to do a game. That's not what the internet and only seems to play think. things that are fun because that's what games are for. Well, I, I'm going to close these. It's books. a new concept. No more D&D. Okay. <laughs> so then what is, what is Reddit for? Then? Reddit Sadness. is... Yeah. Yeah, Reddit for sadness. Reddit Angry. is where you go to be sad. You go to games to be fun and Reddit to be sad. It's a nice okay. balance. Yeah, great. <laughs> That's why they bounce back and forth so frequently. Yep. yep. Uh, we know that base D&D is just like generic European fantasy with a bunch of other lore bits from all over the place mashed together like it doesn't matter. If you made your own branded setting and put your face on the cover, what would that setting be? My face is on the cover. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. You have or to or be, in you the have sleeve to... of the book. Right. Yeah, you know, right. That's what you're saying. My name's on it, right? It's now yes. they're like, hey, come to a ROM world. <laughs> yeah. Play a both. ROM. What is a ROM world? Tell me. A ROM world, a ROM world would have- It has have, really nice balconies. A ROM world would have to have really good universal health care. So let's start okay. there. Because right. otherwise a ROM world is going to collapse very quickly. And also, a ROM world, oh my God, a ROM world would need so many extra signs to just get <laughs> people around, around in a ROM world. This is world. a world book. <laughs> We're not building a world where you won't die. Oh, no, no, no. A ROM, so like a ROM, right? Like if the whole world like works like me. I lived in D.C. for over 20 years. I used public transportation the entire time. Every time I got off a metro stop, there would be like, you know, like in the old iPhones where to reorient the map, you had to make like that circle eight motion, right? Mm-hmm. I had to physically like turn around like, until <laughs> my magnetism. So really, like, you, you know. get on the train. The train only go is one direction. It's on a track. It's underground. I don't know where that is. <laughs> it's <laughs> underground. Like it could you can't be anywhere. Feel, like, no, which... no. It's dark <laughs> and we're in tunnels. I could be going up. Who possibly? could know. Okay, so a ROM world does not have underground transportation. Oh, no, it does. It's just that once we get above ground, we just like, there's like a bunch of helpful signs saying, hello, a ROM, this is where you need to go. Like a ROM world needs mm. an iPhone for everyone who's walking. Like we need directions okay. for walking. Okay. Because okay. that's what so I do. So you got some some high tech uh, D and D stuff going on here. We need Google uh, Glass, man. Good, that's what good we need. Magit- Magitech, right? Yeah. Uh, you've you've got some. Uh, you you would probably have to add a healing cantrip. Yes. Uh, because Lord knows D&D needs one of those. It would be. Um, it'd be it, the thing that Link has. Every one of yeah. us would have that little sprite following us around, just keeping us from dying. Oh, <laughs> there you that's, that's not what that's for in Zelda. No, I've never, I've never <laughs> had a mental misunderstanding oh, no. of how this game works. I have never no. played a Zelda game. Has that is that clear? But, I, have, I just te- thought that was te- a helpful technically, sprite. Technically yeah, from the, the original Zelda helpful. series. Yeah. Uh, finding a fairy would give you full health. So. It's just Tinkerbell, right? That's what I assume. Do I am I way off? No, you're, you're right. Hey. Except it's usually like in the game where there was a fairy following Isn't you around it, like, all the really time. Annoying? It just told you about what enemies do. It was giving yeah. you warnings. It was heads and, up, and, and it I always said, that. "Hey, yeah. listen." It did not heal you ever. No, it was your buddy. Yeah. It just said, "Hey, listen," and well, now you have kind of traumatic friend stress. Heal you. Yeah, I could really Most use a friend that tells me where danger is. I mean, that would be really helpful. Mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah, then I wouldn't have fallen down those stairs and broken my hand last year. Yeah, yeah. that's true. Stairs yeah. are dangerous. Yeah. What what hey. what is what does Dylan world look like? Okay. Yeah. So I it's all farm adjacent. I I honestly do think more farms are good and yep. uh-huh. more food is good. We should talk about food more. Um but food's great. But if I'm building like a D D game, mm-hmm. I'm not adding stuff, I'm taking a scalpel to it. Like, there's mm. a bunch of stuff in D&D that has weird implications. Like, I'm not a fan of the bar just ambiently existing without any explanation. 
the fact that magic somehow translates into music is clearly a huge world building thing and should be a factor in the world. So when mm. one character randomly shows up like, yeah, I studied for years, I can cast fireball, I can do all these interesting things. I have the blood of a dragon in me. Oh, well, I channel my power through a through a drag through a god and that allows me to shoot lightning. And one guy's like, yeah, I learned a couple of Beatles tracks <laughs> and I can make that 30 foot sphere explode. Yeah. yeah, it's I, it's amazing to me that like D and D has so many books, yep. but and like there's still so much missing. The things so, so that are missing. there because like you know, like as somebody who has read a ton of L five R stuff, yeah. that one suffers from the problem of like too much lore that overlaps each other and kind of undoes mm. other things. But D and D somehow like just like there are things that are still just not explained just at all it, it, it feels like it it wants to be a framework right it, yeah. it wants to be a place that has these concrete building blocks with a whole bunch of space between them but they're like all hollow inside exactly yes. to, so you so you fill them up yourself right and the other major issue you run into is because of that asymmetry i brought up before mm -hmm. you're pr also presenting the framework to the wrong people like, mm. if you're building a world and you say, hold on, like, for, like I said, I don't have a problem with someone playing a bar in my game, that is fine. But, like, if I were to try to, like, hollow it down mm -hmm. and I'm like, well, I don't really like the way bards work. I don't want to have that be a feature of the world. The players have already seen it. They were told that the rules of the game are bards exist. Right. So now I'm the monster who's sitting there yes. telling you no i'm gonna take toys away from you because the game made a world that didn't make sense and i mm. was told to make a narrative right. experience that would make sense and i can't right. anymore yeah i mean i think you really have to have players that are on board with yeah. you know it, like you have to have those kinds of conversations before you've invited people to a game mm -hmm. and you have to like have players that are really willing to sort of narrow down you know, their options and, and yeah. follow along with that vision and trust that vision. Or and not everybody like, is. Like most games that don't create that <laughs> dynamic, that don't have that separation <laughs> are going to have game. you do a session zero where you talk about the world. And if somebody comes to me and says, I want to play a bard. Well, OK, cool. Then I will make sure this is a world where that makes sense. Sure. Mm -hmm. But if nobody yeah. made a bard at character creation, my base assumption is that there aren't any. Right. Like, oh, right. The, what would you add to your world, Dylan? No, I would take guillotines. It out. That's what I would add. <laughs> guillotines. All I'm not saying the kill the bards. <laughs> you can still have bards, just not magical. You can have right? bards. And I don't like, want bards. And there wouldn't be and there wouldn't be a, a reason to play there as a player character yeah. because they would just be people that sit in their taverns and just fight. Right. Yeah. You just like, throw coins at them. Yes. Yeah. yeah. yeah, yeah. No, but like, and then they become <laughs> and then they become rogues or rangers and they fit yeah. into like an archetype that already is fairly natural in the world where it's like if you're gonna have something where it's like you sing and that becomes magic then song has to somehow be magic right. and that has to be an important yep. element in your game or okay. you have the thing where like all of the subclasses right. for barter label as colleges, which means that it's an education based thing, which means it's a type of wizard. Right. So what are wizards? Yep. Exactly. So what are like why are so why are, are those not wizard? related? So you're a music right. wizard now and you made your casting class right. that charisma, but like why aren't I'm a these theater wizard actually? Yeah. <laughs> I studied musical theater. Yeah. <laughs> but, but also you're rather roguish and handy with a with a rapier. So like right. you know. Right. So it, you it, can it, do it, stage it fits, combat. It's like it is a jack of all trades thing. So like it should fit. It's just that part of like that that, that one part where like D and D doesn't ever want to do the work of ecology with its monsters, mm. with its magic, with its items, with its land. It never like like a dragon. How much yeah. land does it take up? How much? room does it need how many other dragons yeah. could be near nearby mm. what does that push out what is that you know like like what all these things that they want to exist in a world cannot exist in a world there's yeah. not room for every, every everything so what's the conflict how yeah. does that work out is are there portals no. are there other like give us Honestly, some idea yeah. and there's nothing in the front of the book that is like here are five lists mm -hmm. pick three right. from each is, to build your world there is like, one time they do that they do that with races. Yep. They say these are the standard fantasy races. Yep. And if you want... Wreck to elves. Well, because that, yep. that's let's, let's be racist. Right. Yeah. Right. That's what and if you racist. want to do half orcs, those are optional. And if you want to do half elves, those are optional. If you want to do a tiefling, that's an option. If you want to do mm -hmm. gnomes, those are optional, which they shouldn't be. They should just be discarded. Gnomes are <laughs> terrible. Just make your halfling a wizard, you coward. Uh, 
Tell us how you really feel. Tell he us. really hates gnomes. I don't like gnomes. <laughs> what? Up several times. I have objections. Here's the to thing: bards. is that like I don't somehow like gnomes. I already yes. knew that you didn't like gnomes. Mm-hmm. Like, has that come oh, up yeah. on probably? On, it, it, okay. it was it came definitely a hundred percent on kill every month. Okay, because yeah. I was like somehow before we recorded, like I already know you don't like gnomes. Yeah. yeah. It, they, it was it was a big discussion point. It's in, all efficiency. In like your design, you do it with a purpose. If right. you want to make gnomes, like there is nothing a gnome does in world building that is not a halfling that learned cantrips. Right. It's mm-hmm. So point. don't put them there. Like right. don't make well, your world D&D, more like, complicated like, for no reason. How will we make more books? Right. <laughs> well, D is about the numbers, right? right? It's it's a it's like you said. It, it's like the video games that we we've grown up with and love that also don't make sense yeah. Yeah. right because you, you have to have enemies to fight and, this and is the enemies have to be like, varied we yeah. talked about this going in that you guys wanted to feature supplements a lot but one of the things that i keep coming back to is i i built a character for a game with a rom once and i built myself an orc and i did it by saying a rom i'm gonna say i'm an orc but i'm gonna play a human yeah because you can pick a feat mm-hmm. and the moment you start picking feats like if you told me you get a plus two, a plus one, and a feat, I could build a character in any race in D&D because if I say I'm short and I pick magic initiate, well, guess what? I just made a, a gnome. I, yeah. That's it. <laughs> right. if, I, if I say 100%. I'm tall and I pick magic initiate, I'm a high elf now. Mm-hmm. Because the differences are so small. They're yeah. so small. And half of them don't like mechanically matter. It's right. just no. like a descriptive thing. The feat matters more because the feat tells you what they have done until now. Like I'm yeah. a crossbow expert. I'm really good with this. Why? Because of this. I was because in this of my army training, I'm, because whatever. it's important yeah. to my culture. And I grew up as a hunter because mm-hmm. of... It, the only re, the only difference between building a human that is an air quotes elf and building mm-hmm. an actual elf per the rules is dark vision. Yep, that's it. We have bad mm. eyes. That's it. Humans have bad eyes. Yeah, there's well, that. As, as we just finished discussing, all of us are wearing glasses and right, our headphones yeah. are smushing yeah. our faces. There's that fantastic scene in Farscape where they're all in a room and the one human's like, my eyes are fine. Like, read that sink. And every single person can read the label from across the room. And the camera shows the sink. And because it's us humans watching it, we're just seeing a sink. We can't even see the label. <laughs> it's just showing us the sink. But all of them are reading the label right off. Yeah. So yeah, that's what I would do with a D&D book is I would either start organizing it into things that become optional so that you can Mm -hmm. build a world that feels coherent to the story you want to tell, or I would just pick what I wanted to do and I would cut the stuff that doesn't make sense. Yeah. There is a a supplement that came out last year called Ancestry and Culture. Yeah. That um, takes apart like races and is like, "Mm, these things are not necessarily inherent to races, but like... You know, like who your parents were and where you grew up. You know, we talked about like learning crossbow and like all of that kind of stuff is more about how you were raised than like who you are as a race. Mm -hmm. And so I think there are there are certainly people when we talk about supplements, especially people who are like, uh, yeah, no, this is dumb and we can fix it and make it uh, also less racist while we're at it. I also (laughs) want to quickly plug an elf and an orc had a little baby uh, by VJ Harris and Adam Hancock, which is a fantastic book, again, about races and half races and you know all of those stuff because so much of it is dependent on what you learn and what the people around you valued it is not a trivial thing well right it's like i think about like you know like i'm white and like you know irish and like i'm sure that i'm not the only like irish white person around but like my learned experience and cultural experience still totally different from you know like somebody else even yeah next door to me also yeah, white I mean, and irish but i grew up on a farm in canada versus yeah in the suburbs outside parent, of yeah, milwaukee yeah, yeah. <laughs> very different, different experiences my best uh-huh. friend growing up i would go over to his house and the garage door would roll up and there'd be a deer just hanging there right that they had gone yeah. shot that morning that was a it was we were literally like a block apart but yeah our lives were 100 percent different we're raised the same same mm-hmm. school same income level same everything right it's completely right. different people you know mm-hmm. exactly you yeah. know it's like we're just having that discussion too it's like my parents are very very conservative and you know your parents are not like just totally but like we're still in america so yeah mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. yeah 
Yeah, Absolutely. I don't. I don't think. Um, yeah, well, that's like a whole conversation for another time. Is race yeah. in D and D? Yeah, <laughs> and we are not qualified to talk about. We that are one. not the people to discuss yeah, that. Yes, I will yes. point out frequently yes. that it is a problem. I mean, I do feel yeah. very qualified to say it's bad. Yeah. Yeah. like yeah. I feel qualified enough to do that. That's like not I'm a whole saying. lot more, but enough to be like this, this, not this. Mm-mm. Yeah, that anytime we get. In any time we get specific, we go to someone and say, "Hello, your exact, you know, personal experience. Please come and educate <laughs> us because we don't know." And right. fortunately, people have been very kind in order to do so. One I most- really love the kind, like the kinds of discussions that you both are having on your show about, you know, like some of the problems of those monsters and the way things are coded and yep. you know, like that kind of stuff. I think that's it's awesome. Thank you. The amount of depth we got out of a show concept that was, I'm annoyed and want to complain. Yeah. Right? <laughs> hey, hey, this D&D like book this, is bad. Want to talk about it? This, <laughs> we're, we're geared for it, right? Like, they, like we're ready to have those conversations. Right. And we have still had moments where we are completely blindsided because we just weren't paying enough attention. The dragon turtle is a perfect example. We both went in thinking, it's a dragon turtle. It's just a turtle dragon. It's a fun thing. Whatever. Mm-hmm. It's just a monster. Not even considering the fact that of course it has huge cultural tie-ins mm-hmm. you know for right. thousands of years that we just bl- you know just it's, just just blazingly it's bowser right. it's yeah w- which one is the godzilla Gamor- monster gamora uh, uh, not gamora no gamora is the, the green Scott. lady um gamora <laughs> gamora like, like yeah. there's all these and then of course beyond that yeah. there's cultural tie-ins for like a thousand years yeah. right and we just right. didn't know and and gliza was like uh actually uh, <laughs> you know, uh, it was so nice so about it yeah. yeah. But I mean, I think even like, you know, like the hag and things like that, like my son used the word hag and I was like, actually, that's like super sexist. Do not use that word. And yeah. he was like, I didn't know that. And yeah. I was like, well, let's have a discussion about yeah. how we talk about women who are, you know, like not super pretty and not, you know, but like, like I said, it's just like they took all kinds of cultural touchstones that were like, mm, what if we put them all in a book? That's not racist, right? If we yeah. put everything in there, we right. just like pile it on top of each other, then it's like technically it's, represented, it's right? It's all stuck in the doorway. It can't possibly be racist. Right? Like we, like, what do you mean? We we put something of everybody's in there. It's fine. It's a 16-year-old yeah. white boy mentality of, I can't be racist. I hate everyone. Like, yeah. Right? Like, like, right? Yeah, you're right. That did help. That certainly made the situation better. <laughs> Way to go, pal. Yep. Yep. Um, Way to go, Chet. Yep. So uh, most games of uh, Dungeons and Dragons require the player's handbook, uh, some polyhedral dice, uh, pencil friends, blah, 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 blah. Um, Pizza, Mountain Dew. Yeah, all all that fun stuff. Um, Do you have any other tools or accessories that you would recommend uh, already that you think are just kind of cool to uh, check out? For me, and I hate to say it, because it is additional cost. And I hate to tell people to spend additional money, especially when they've already bought books. For me, a person with severe ADHD who has a lot of trouble learning from books, having D&D Beyond has been a revolutionary tool to allow me to play this game. We talked about it a ton in our yeah. first episode. Mm-hmm. Like, you are mm-hmm. not the only one to say that. Like, I, there was a solid, like, 10 minutes in there where we're like, let me tell you about D&D Beyond. And, <laughs> and, you, say, that, but and you say, don't, and you say, don't, you know, don't like people, you know, spending money and stuff, but like, People have dice and like yeah. so much dice and they just it's keep true. buying dice and it's fine. I, and how I, many I do the same thing. have I bought? To yep. do the- exactly. And it is a different thing. Like, like, like yeah, all, yeah. The, all the people are like, well, just wrap it into the cost. I'm like the amount of effort people put into making D&D Beyond work is considerable. You can't just ignore that cost. Yeah, and the amount of stuff that like people put in there, you know, yeah. like because there's like tons of adventures and supplements mm-hmm. and like all the, mm-hmm. that you get access yeah, to. A like, lot more accessible than mm-hmm. the physical books in a lot of cases. And uh, it's nice sure. to just have like a trove of it all in one place too. Okay. So like not have to like, again, with the ADHD, like if you make me hunt it down, I will give up. When <laughs> I sat down at D&D Live and the cameras were on me for the first time and I have to D&D a game in front of a lot of people and I was scared and the fact that I could do it from an iPad and mm-hmm. everything I needed, and it worked. Like, the whole adventure, I could run it, could roll the dice, could know where everyone's hit point. Like, I could just do it. And it, it, that was amazing. That was revolutionary to me. Yeah. I literally needed nothing else to make a whole game work. The idea of having to, like, add and subtract on camera really just gives me, like, hives. It's terrifying. <laughs> it's terrifying. <laughs> I turned to one of the up players, like, five minutes before the cameras went live, and, and they actually said, do I have any discernible talents? Like that? <laughs> 
That was the question. No. <laughs> Dylan. <laughs> it wasn't Dylan, otherwise that's the answer of the gun. But it, but it Just helped. the pep talk you needed. Yeah, exactly. Uh-huh. No, and it's too late. Start working. <laughs> no, and there's nothing you can do about it. Camera's going. Mm-hmm. What about you, Dylan? Do you have stuff that you that you use or like? I annoy Aram. Uh-huh. Because mm-hmm. uh, I love him always. No matter what he does, I love him always. I just pretend he does for the show. Because despite being a child with a driver's license younger than him, uh, literally true. <laughs> Uh, I, I like analog, uh, D and D beyond is massively convenient. I, I will not argue with that. It's great for a lot of people. Note cards, oh, love just note cards and a pen. Like if you can mm. write down the name of an NPC and a couple little things and throw it in the middle of the table. So your players have it just like making it so that all of the resources are immediately available to all your players in a way that is instantly accessible because like still with D and roll 20 you do have to build sheets or like figure out how to work mm-hmm. with the interface make everything so yeah if if i go into a new room and i'm like all right listen combat's about to start here in a big ballroom here are the three resources that are immediately apparent in the room you know there's a balcony up there there's this chandelier that you can clearly see has the ability to drop and there's this and i'll just throw those three cards out of there and just like now they are yeah. on the table you can see that they mm-hmm. exist it makes things a little bit more real. So, yeah. yeah, I think when I when I'm playing games in person and when I oh, yeah. you know very very rarely run games in person, I like to have like physical things. I know when I've run L five R in the past, I have people like if I have characters that are using magic, they get cards that say like what each spell does, so that it's like right in front of you and you can look at it. Mm. Um, like having those kind of physical handouts are super yeah. helpful. It's it's much harder like, online. Um, yeah. It's, and in which case, like dice rollers and like all of that kind of stuff is really nice. But. Interface is always at a layer. There's mm-hmm. always a little bit of difficulty, a little bit of hesitation. And when you're playing a game, every little hesitation adds up. So yeah. That, yeah. it is really nice to have an analog thing where you're like, boom, here it is. And everyone mm-hmm. instantly understands it. Yeah. And it's nice to have. I mean, that is one nice thing about D&D Beyond, though, is that it's a sort of agreed upon thing that everybody uses yeah. you know it's not like oh i use this dice roller and character sheet thing yeah, i yep. use this one it's like everybody who plays D is like this is the one we're all in that's in- the opposite side like when i do obs layouts right i take the extra time to do nothing else but use roll 20 dice to green screen out the background and have those dice roll live over mm. the obs layout so that i see it the players see it the audience sees it all at the same time. We all react yeah. at the same time. In that case, it brings us together. But yeah, the effort to get yeah. us there takes right. a lot. It, it definitely, yeah, it's a lot of extra work. It, it doesn't D&D Beyond have it where only like one person needs to have the full thing for a yeah. campaign. You can have like, an assigned yeah. DM, which doesn't actually have to be the DM of the campaign. So just like if one of your players already has the account, do it. Uh, we can share great. all of their resources with the rest of the party. Yep. Yes. Yeah. So so if, if a, like a group that was it was going to be playing together for decades, say, and they buy into that. So only one person needs to just shovel everything into that one account, and yeah, now, yep. now your whole group is set. It. Mm-hmm. Right, that, that's and that's true. pretty cool. As long that's as, pretty cool. As long as you're all friends, as long as you right. like, don't yeah. break out. You're like, oh, I invested in all this D and D beyond. Yeah, and then yeah. Your group falls apart, and then yeah, mm-hmm. yeah, they could buy out costs. <laughs> stop being our friend, then we'll have like some stock <laughs> options. And but if, but if I early. burn this bridge, I won't have all those books anymore. Yeah, right. right. I have yeah, to but... stay friends with this person. <laughs> Just want to make a real quick recommendation. Uh, this is something uh, Grant Howitt had suggested was uh, you can make location little like little tents. Just fold a note card in half, label it with the location. But if you're doing this in prep, you can also label all of those features of interest on a second tent and just leave it under there. So if you're ever doing oh. an investigation campaign or something where they can move to different locations and you just want to have those things immediately available, you just have them out on the table like, OK, cool. So you're going to the cathedral. OK, well, here's all the things you That's need to know about the smart. cathedral. And then the, oh, that's really smart. they're that already sounds like there. way more prep than Grant would ever do. I, <laughs> I know. <laughs> Well, see, it's advice. It doesn't mean that. that right, Grant, it doesn't mean he did. Okay. To be fair, it was also sorry, for, Grant. We yeah. love you. <laughs> it was also advice Grant made for running a game, or like specifically a scenario that he wrote for a book. 
Oh, okay. So, this is stuff that was well, a little easier to. I was like, I've played in your games before. I don't. Yeah. <laughs> writing something, writing something yeah. down, let, writing something ahead of time. Yeah. No. Well, and, and speaking of note cards, uh, my my kids just got these four by six uh, blank card stock mm -hmm. uh, cards that are for like photo backing. Yeah. And and it's just like a stack full of them like a couple hundred of these cards and and like these are perfect for like notes for yep for drawing out a little map for you know all these little things that you can do in a game and i'm like i gotta get some of these for myself because th this is fantastic totally. it's like a little bit more utility than a note card because note cards are you know they're itty bitty uh mm -hmm. at times but well but you this, can buy bigger ones you can but now uh, you gotta find those and Staples, snacks, or staples. Or oh, they're usually right next Amazon. to the regular ones. <laughs> Sometimes, probably like Target. Okay. To be fair, I haven't shot for note cards since uh, college, uh, and How? I still, How are you I living still, your life? I still have them. Yeah, but you've been down that aisle of a CVS since then, I, right? I, I honestly <laughs> don't uh, play in person as much yeah, as I fair, need fair. to. Uh, yeah. So, like, most of my yeah, notes are electronic. Anymore? I also yeah. don't see but, people frequently. <laughs> I yeah. also just really like note cards. <laughs> this has I, nothing to do with the amount of people no. I see. I haven't gone anywhere in two and a half years, but I love note cards. I'm in this, in, in this impossible position where I absolutely love paper and paper stuff, right? But I am so ADHD that if it's not digital, it doesn't have any use to me because it will just get up in a doom box and mm -hmm. be lost. Like it's like, like not, it's not functional. So mm. I love paper, but it doesn't, it's just bad for me. <laughs> you know, it's good for instantaneous reminders that you immediately throw out. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Dylan, I think this is the question that you were waiting for yes. too. Uh, what kinds of themes do you think D and D is best at and which ones does it just not do? Literally only progression. D&D is a system that starts you at level one, which kind of sucks, and ends at level 20, which is essentially apotheosis. But otherwise... If you get there. Yeah, if you get there. But otherwise, it's... There's a lot that we've developed around it since, like, we've we built a huge culture around role-playing and, like, the creativity aspects of it. But when you look at the design of D&D, it is meant to go from room to room, bashing the monster on the head until you're a god. That's it. Yep. It is exceptionally bad at horror. Stop trying to run horror games in D&D, &D, you yes. little <laughs> gremlin monsters. Yep, it is, it is the worst possible setup for horror. Why? D&D &D is about power. It is literally just about increasing your ability to kill the opponent. And there is no exit to conflict aside from death. Yep. Like the... The game is occasionally like, oh, and award your player's experience if they happen to find a non-combat solution to the encounter. And they never it's give like an if example. They happen of to the, find it, but like yeah. they don't give an example didn't... for what that means or how you would use any of your abilities. Well, that, that's, feel that's like what the people writing for. it are like, email me if you think of something. Right. Let me yeah, know. Yeah, let yeah, me we're know looking for ideas. We could put out a fourth book of non-combat solutions, yeah. but <laughs> that's the so, only way, though. So, you roll for persuasion. You roll for intimidate. If those fail, then you, roll you for only initiative. got one button left and you roll for initiative. Yeah. Yep. No, yeah. and that's the <laughs> thing. Like, for horror to work, you need to feel like the entire thing is a feeling of powerlessness, of being up against something that you cannot handle. But in D&D, &D, the base assumption is that there is a way around this. I can handle it which means you're going to die, which means yeah. the DM now has to, a good DM is going to realize their players aren't backing down and try to dial it back. But now you've dialed back the threat, which means it's no longer scary, which means your players win, which means you did mm. not achieve horror. You achieved a conflict with a monster. D&D &D right. is set up for you to have four fights a day and then rest. That is how the mechanics are set up. That is not how you fight a werewolf in real life. It's just not how you do it. In and real the, life, when you fight a werewolf. Life. Yes, in real life. <laughs> listen, when you fight a okay, So Diana yes. gets rabies. We got to take right. her down. Like, it's just that's like, just, what are you going to do? We talked about it. Diana knows. She, yeah. yeah, absolutely. He's ready. But he that, knows. And, it's, and because that's how the game is set up, it 
purposely nerfs horror. Werewolves mm-hmm. are an excellent example. That werewolf is weak, and it is weak because it is easy to become a werewolf. And if all your party is now werewolves and they're incredibly strong, it wrecks the game. Zombies are not zombies. As we discussed, yes. they do not infect you and cause it to rapidly spread because then there would be no mm-hmm. zombies or there would be, oops, all, all zombies. zombies. And we can't have that because that's not a stable <laughs> thing for know, D&D to put in a book. You know that your fighter is going to get bitten. Yep. And hide and it. not tell anybody. Mm-hmm. Yep. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And then he's going to hide no, in the dark corner no. of a the tower. The person who's going to hide it is the low-level paladin who doesn't have immunity to disease yet. That's yep. who's going to uh, hide it. And, mm-hmm. and, and can we just say, now that we're talking about zombies, now I'm going to put us on a little bit of a tangent. Yeah. There was a Twitter thread going around. Uh, if, if a zombie is animated, can its ghost haunt the animated corpse? And now can you have a the ghost and the zombie body at, in the same encounter? That's interesting. So right? I because say, the, yeah. the, go, the ghost, the soul is detached from the zombie. Yeah. The body itself, the body is just a husk that can be yeah. reanimated mm-hmm. through magic. Which we do know that like the yeah. soul is off doing what I, being Whatever. a butler in butler heaven. Yeah. Right? <laughs> yeah. So yes. now, now the soul comes down as a ghost to haunt this area, the same area that its animated corpse is in. Okay. And now you've got this ghost like just watching its body walk around mindlessly. Mm-hmm. How does that's yeah. gotta be weird because the corpse is being animated by something else obviously yeah magic right yeah so there you go so there you go so here's I, I thought that was fascinating yeah, to I'm think totally about I'm totally on board that. for all of that I like that yeah. quite a lot yeah 100% so here's the other thing that's real fun about ghosts specifically in D&D mm-hmm. they're bound mm-hmm. ghosts right. do not come into being you make ghosts they have to be bound somewhere so like Mm. that could of course be you die while having some sort of mystical attachment that just doesn't break right but it isn't the thing where in a grisly murder a normal peasant becomes a ghost so it is actually a situation where you have to engineer this and it's part of why they Uh cast necromancy as evil because the Mm -hmm. thing you've done now is you found a dead person you brought their you animated their body to just be living and hungry and murderous and then you grabbed their soul and tied it to a thing in a way that immediately corrupts the soul to make it hate everyone around it and you've just yeah. created this terrible compound monster yeah you've also just described you though yeah so no, I, am, I am an empty meat husk haunted by a ghost that doesn't particularly want to be here uh, <laughs> there yeah. you go I want to give one more reason D&D is bad at horror. And it's quantized magic. Magic exists in spell slots, in discreetly described spells, and you can't do eldritch horror with magic that is clearly defined. Mm. Yeah. Unless you rewrite the rules. Unless which you completely rewrite the rules. Of- Supplements yeah. do. Which Technic- yeah. technically still part of rules as written because right in Someone the DM's guide, them. do whatever you want because Terrible that's cop out. up to Don't you. Don't care yeah, what's but, in the book. Uh, I like, really hate when books sense. do that. I, I could really hate it. I could literally hand you a guide on tic tac toe and start it with, but add whatever you want, and it's, and it's the <laughs> but, same exact but, thing. But, but what do I know? I could play <laughs> chess and tell you that this is my my homebrew hack of tic tac toe, and you can't tell me I'm wrong because the DMG said this was fine. It might yep. even be true. It might. <laughs> it might. It might. might have happened that way. Yeah, where the it's like in Star like Trek. And- Maybe he invented transparent aluminum. Who knows? <laughs> <laughs> but it's still D and D. It's all still D and D. It's just D and D with spaceship and whales and Vulcans, but it's still D and D. Okay, but well, let's discuss how I have the uh, Stargate role playing game, which is in five E. Hundred percent. Yep. So many yeah, games are made do- in five E. Whatever you want. What was the one recently where they were like, Dark Souls. Uh, they wanted to, it was Dark Souls. And I was like, you, well, okay, yes. <laughs> you know, as soon as I heard that, I was like, yeah, yeah, Dark Souls 5e, that makes complete perfect sense. I don't know why anyone's upset. I think this is a great analogy. So aside from just uh, adventuring, uh, what kinds of things do you think GMs should have their characters do in Dungeons and Dragons? Play a different game die there aren't rules for anything that isn't adventuring you anything you do that isn't adventuring is not in the D book and you're making it up as you go along but it'd be like a good shopping montage which you should do and that is good that is fine do a lot of downtime have those conversations 
there there aren't enough things to spend money in in fifth edition let your players buy a house and have a place that they operate out of and build these things up like those world building things are phenomenal and those are also a great time to realize that there are other games that have written these small highly directed experiences and legitimately in the middle of D&D when you have a session that you have to deal with a bit of story that isn't adventuring play a different game for a bit Mm -hmm. I love when there are like those breaks between D&D adventures and people bring in like other games or like rules from other games Mm -hmm. to run social interactions or things like that. I'm a big fan of players going to parties to like meet Mm -hmm. different people and have different like and then kind of from there pick what adventure they want to go on based on who they meet and what they talk about and stuff like that. I'm going to timestamp this uh, recording real quick. Uh, Last week was the last episode of campaign, I believe, where... uh, James D'Amato was running concurrently a session in Genesis and then doing flashbacks yep. to a game of Starcross by Alex yes. Roberts, which is phenomenal. Yes. And if you haven't bought Starcross yet, you're wrong. Fix it. Uh, yep. <laughs> Series three. Yep. Covered yep. It. it was great. But that's that's the thing. It's like sometimes there are bits of the story where just do a different thing. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Serve your needs. It's phenomenal. It, uh, yeah. The the way that they they just easily blended that in so good uh it's uh, fantastic and who's editing that show right now is it tracy or casey uh, it's it's both both right now yeah the general setup of james tracy and casey that whole thing was magnificent seriously good work folks phenomenal phenomenal yep the other thing about it is it ties back to what we were talking earlier if D D is now the video game analogy every Fantasy video game has the little side quest games that are different mm-hmm. games than the core game. So it's the perfect analog example of that as well. Yeah. Yeah. Like if you go fishing in any Zelda game, it's like a completely different game than it's a mini game. like yeah. actually doing combat or anything like that. And the so. break is welcome. You're like, oh, yeah. this is nice. I I want I don't want to grind. I just want to fish for the next two hours. It's peaceful. Yeah, it's, it's fun on its own. Yeah. Yeah. Yep, in between every round in uh, Mario Party, you've got to go and do your little mini game. Yeah, absolutely. You know? yeah. Obviously, everybody knows that well-known campaign of Mario Party. Yeah. <laughs> and I can't agree with Dylan Moore that having. Oh, wait, sorry, my, my my brain fell in my head. What what what, what was that first part you said about? Um, doing like Damn basically it. doing kingdom building building out like the the house of the players because they don't have a way to spend their money once they've bought full plate. As soon as you can possibly give your players a base whether it's a yes. boat whether it's a house whether it's like whatever it is you give them a base and that is going to generate story mm-hmm. they are going to decorate it they're they are they're going to yeah. care about it they're going to care about the people who live around it or who operate it, it yep. instantly mm-hmm. invest them this is in actually, an area like nothing else can we're going to sidetrack mm-hmm. into dm advice here one of the worst pieces of advice that people give that is also good advice is take things away from your players you cannot <laughs> like if you give your players a magic sword and then you have someone steal it. Yeah, that's a great motivator, but you've made the players really, really angry. It's something that was on their character sheet. It feels sacred to them. But if they have a house, if they have a butler, and you break in, or you attack them, or they own a castle and they lay siege to it and you knock over a tower, there's now mm-hmm. a quest attached to that. I have to repair this. Or someone came into our home and our privacy was violated, but it feels less sacrosanct to the player because mm-hmm. it was a piece on the board. It's not part of them. It was an object they own. Mm-hmm. Making possessions external. Right. It doesn't change their abilities in the game. Yeah. Right. Mm-hmm. But it's still a violation that needs to be answered. Yeah. Right. So you've created something that works really, really well for story hooks. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Something you're emotionally attached to. Mm-hmm. Is- yeah, right. Especially in something like D&D where it doesn't naturally build those bonds no. like mm-hmm. it does. You know, there are other games where you ask all of those like relationship questions in the beginning yeah. or, you know, like they're mm-hmm. you're sort of like grounded in the setting or yeah. with the NPCs. In the backstory, they can kill all the parents they want. They can't kill their mortgage. It's right. still going to be there. <laughs> yeah, right. Oh, painfully no. true. Mm-hmm. Ca- capitalism, worst enemy of D&D. Mm-hmm. Yeah. <laughs> Yes, all my characters are orphans, actually, yeah. and all their friends. Remember, too. all of your adventures are actually your adventures are actually kind of terrible. You mm-hmm. are the worst capitalists. You have yeah. so much money, you can't figure out how to spend it. You could bring, yeah. lift an entire town out of poverty, and you decided that you were going to get a sword that shoots fire yeah. and occasionally yeah, turns yeah. into a just, plate. 
I don't want to why, don't you, why don't you build a rocket ship Just, instead of solving world yeah, hunger? Yeah, I don't want to cure cancer, Dylan. I want a sword that fires <laughs> lightning bolts and speaks to me and is condescending. <laughs> exactly. I want a yeah. condescending well. sword, Dylan. Yeah, you absolutely have to. Um, mm-hmm. No, that's that's the reason why I love like games like uh, Beyond the Wall. Mm-hmm. I play that with my local group and... You, you start off the game, you make your village. Mm-hmm. You, like part of character creation yeah. is you get this thing, now define an NPC. You get this thing, now define a place that, that may or may not relate to that thing. And now you've got a village to start off with. Yeah. That's your home base. You go to the campaign setting, you're building all the major locations and minor locations yeah. of, of everything around your village. And, and now you've got this world that every single player at that table is super invested in how much yeah. does your play your party stay in one place right like if you don't give yeah. them a home base you, you, amelia is completely right there are other games that do it better in terms of building inter-party intra-party bonds mm-hmm. but you're inherently going to have a bond with all the other players because they are the only constant in your experience mm-hmm. put them somewhere Give them a mm-hmm. house. They now have to come back and there are NPCs that they will bond with. There are people that they yeah. will see repeatedly instead of going yeah. to the newest dungeon where the gnolls should just be all, all murdered until you get to the chest at the bottom that isn't a mimic, I promise. And then you go back. Well, and adventuring. how many games have we played where like the players get really, you know, like a, a DM makes up this NPC and then the players get weirdly attached to them. Always. I like, yep. right. So. So give them a house in a town and then that NPC can live there instead of having to go Uh along in every single adventure. They're going to do it anyway. What? Kyle, the 12 year old NPC, got his house burned down by a dragon? Kyle, you live with us now. Go to my house. I sent Kyle to the PC. Yeah, Kyle can dog sit while we go on our adventure. And mm-hmm. he's like, I think the reason why a lot of DMs get hung up on this is because D&D is inherently a game that was built in its bones about killing something, getting gold, gold is experience, gold equals advancement. So anytime right. we're like, there's gold involved, even if it's like theoretical gold, like a, like a base of operations, there is a theoretical, there's a theoretical amount of gold involved that even if like you found that it was willed to you by the nice old man that you saved, right? Whatever it is, there's still gold attached and they get hung up on this idea of the gold because again, so much of D&D is defensive. Well, they could sell that house and make 50,000 gold and then buy plus two armor and now you've unbalanced the game. So right. much of D&D is around that mindset, which I think is very dumb. And yeah. It really doesn't really exist. So here's so, a question, though. Like, because it's very clear that D&D started that way and obviously has evolved by the time we've gotten to 5th edition and then especially when you start adding in all of these other things people are making that are trying to do all of these different things. Mm-hmm. Like, how... How do we reconcile that? Like, how do you reconcile the fact that, like, you know, gold is still kind of considered, but, like, we don't really use it. Like, I, you never really buy Watsi anything. You know, like, has, how do you make all of that work? It's all in Wizards' hands because they put <laughs> oh, out. okay. Well, then never mind. Yeah, we're, we're a little screwed because <laughs> yeah. this whole s- surge of books being written, right? Like, this happened with mm-hmm. the uh, old open license. Aram, do you remember OGL, right? Yeah. Yep. Mm -hmm. The OGL had so many like books for 3.5, but at the end of the day, the way the core rule books get written is they are refinements and adjustments to how the core mechanics of D&D work. They haven't been Mm -hmm. adding new things. They've been adding new classes, but every book is skills and how to do murders and how to do combat. And then someone else will release a new book. They've also been making it worse. Like you're talking about like, maybe they could fix the problem, but they have decidedly made it worse by releasing things like the college of creation bard who can make any non-magical material. So now we're talking about bards that can pump out diamonds and emeralds and Mm -hmm. other things to make all the limitations on these spells that existed before. Not a problem at all anymore. So now there's no limitations on actual materials. None of it makes any sense, but because it's so tied into things like you still need the diamonds to resurrect and you still like, it doesn't matter at all. It's completely ephemeral, but it still matters. They still haven't written it out of the rules. They've just weakened it further and further. Mm. But it, it seems though, like they, they want to embrace sort of this 
culture that's happening around D and D where people are making things. I mean, like they want to embrace the like critical roles and the you know, like all of that kind of stuff that like as not so much like a company, but like, you know, on this cultural level of D&D, they're like, yeah, it's great that you can do anything. Like, they're more than happy to be like, yeah, everything is D&D. Oh, yeah. You can do anything you want in D&D. Build Star Wars D&D. Build Arkham Horror D&D. Right. But they're not doing anything with the rules to really, like, assist with that. Here's the problem. So the book says you can do anything you want. And when, the, and when it's a book, that works great. People read the book. They make whatever decisions they want. But that's not what D&D is as a company anymore. They just bought D&D Beyond for a reason. They've been pushing towards digital for a reason. This whole everyone being at home just kicked that forward. They're going to be a digital production company that makes things for an online experience that also has books. So the fact that they have to now force these things to work digitally, to work through computers and screens, they're just going to get more tied down into mm -hmm. gold pieces and numbers and digits because they have to because of the medium they're working yeah. with. Right, because you can't narrative yeah. stats. Like, it's harder to hand wave. One of the handful yeah. of like, fourth edition did a lot of things right. It had a lot of good things. It had a lot of problems. One of the problems was it was built specifically for Adventure League, which is right. almost mm. a diluted version of this. I need to make sure that yeah, when my has... players wander into their game store on whatever night it was, uh, that their character is going to work, even if this is a new game store. So everything had gold yeah, piece like values. It's specifically for characters between this level and this level, and by the end of the adventure, they get this reward and level up this much. Yep. And, and they can buy these items and blah, 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 blah. And 5th yep. edition, because people got mad about that, is a complete reversal, where now instead of everything having a monetary value, nothing has a monetary value. You should be able to finish the game with your starting equipment. We're not going to balance monsters around you having magic items. And that's mm. our solution now. The only thing D&D has ever done has made sure that money doesn't matter. Right. Yeah. Mm. That's it. Either by making it yeah. part of the actual experience of like, this is now a resource that your character is really meant to spend and isn't meant to build out the world more, or by straight up just going like, we'll keep giving you money, but it doesn't mean anything. Mm. Yeah. Can like still making it the reward for everything, yeah. right. but not valuable. Yeah. <laughs> right, but not valuable, which, which frankly is the only... Which is a good thing in the end, because the other way this could have gone is that D&D &D just said it's very, very valuable. And here's how you can spend real money mm. to get it. So at least right. we dodged yeah. that bullet. Right. So, so my, my question is, when are we getting the supplement or interior decorating? Should, it should right. be immediate. Okay, so Marvel <laughs> yeah. superheroes has like what do we what do we find out sixty like pages four, or something to building your base? Of, yeah, yeah. Uh, uh, it doesn't like matter. Picking living room sets. Wondrous and, yeah. items are the best part of D and D. Uh, yeah. Hands Agreed. down, no mechanical benefits. I love but, those books when I get them when they show up in like my Ennies stuff. Yeah. There was one that was like the like a grimoire, uh, like the Gem Hammer grimoire, I think last year that had like it's just like a whole book of magical items, yeah, just for funsies. Yeah, like, just cool you, things. I love them. You build a house for your players. Great. Here's how much it costs to put in a suit of armor that's also your butler. Right. Like <laughs> there was one where it was a coin, and if you drop it for every like ten feet, it falls. When it hits the ground, it makes a ding. It's this little thing. So, like, how deep is this well? Well, you're not going to get your coin back, but you'll know how deep the well is. Yeah. Right? <gasps> little teeny things like that. That's so cool. Yeah. I love stuff like that. There was someone on the Discord for Kill Every Monster who was talking about, like, hey, I have this shield that I made, like, for my game. It's a plus two shield. I'm going to give it stuff where it can, like, grow vines and reach out and do stuff. And uh, he's like, so what, what other abilities can I give it? And I was like, make it a table. Yeah. It grows four limbs. And occasionally it'll just set itself up as like a desk and it'll walk behind you. And now it's now it's your shield. And also it's a pet. And now it's the best yeah. item in the game. <laughs> yep. Yep. If you can make it a pet, it's great. Yeah, the, moment, after the moment your shield decides that it's going to help by trying to pull the cart, but your shield isn't strong enough to pull the cart. So it's just like straining at Little the thing. Legs are going. going like Sonic. Oh. Like, adorable. That, that's the bit that people will remember. Make <laughs> yep. more items. Like you could build an entire interior decorating thing that is just Ryan. items to that effect and they'd be magical 100 yep. percent. yeah yeah i mean also, like that's the thing is like i would love that and then i would love one about like throwing parties yeah yes yeah throwing throwing parties in D, D is great, great having a ball you can do a whole episode about a ball like i would love a whole section else. on like you can do 
this is why um, in Strata, there's a fashion section because I told Grant I wanted it. (laughs) (laughs) Um, But, you know, it's like, I want to know, I want to know what the fashions are that everybody's wearing. I want to know what kind of foods they're eating. Mm -hmm. I want to know what the decor is. I want to know what weird cultural thing is happening right now I that like, everybody has to like act on. I want one yeah. sheet per character that is how y- the abilities you unlock. Like you can give me a level 1 to 20 and I don't have to know that going in. It doesn't have to be in the player's handbook but at the start of the session like you're going to go to a party. Here's the things that a fighter knows and this is what you can do at a party. Yeah. You've unlocked mm-hmm. up to your yeah. level. Go. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. These are your party <laughs> skills. Like yeah. you know the dance move now. Right. Like. <laughs> Yeah. You know the latest gossip about. I would about. be so happy to burn an entire session doing a repeat character creation of like, based on what you've done in game. Just for the here, party. Here Just are the, the skills you've unlocked. Yeah. You have this mm-hmm. much power point by build your character for the party. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah and you have like this much social capital. And yeah, sure. yeah. I mean, it's already it's sort of in the backgrounds, right? The whole thing of like, oh, you're an acolyte. So if you wander into the church, then everybody's going to know. You're like. You're a fighter. You're a soldier. So you should be able to go over to the bar, find the other guy who holds a rank and be like, oh, where'd you serve? Right. And now you have a friend. And by the end of the party, there are seven of you over there, drunk out of your minds, having the best. Telling stories about the good old days. And that's a fantastic way to like gain information or suddenly create Mm -hmm. an in because now you know these other people. Or yeah, pick up a new job or something like that because you heard overheard something. If more people in D&D bothered to play their backstories, that would happen more often. Very few people play their backstories. Because it doesn't That's reward, like, it this doesn't. is the thing about yeah. D&D, though, is that it doesn't reward that. Right. Like, this is a, it's what I, I mean, too, when I talk about the culture of it, is that, like, you know, we have things where it's like, oh, I play D&D and we had this great character story about all this kind of stuff. And it's like, cool, all that of that D&D. happened in spite of the rules. Yep. Not yep. because of that. All them. the stuff Agreed. I talked about for the backgrounds, they're all abilities to circumvent problems not interact with problems you got into yeah. town and you don't have a place to stay well this guy's an acolyte so we just go to the church and then you don't have a further conversation mm-hmm. yeah right it's just a lever yep mm-hmm. yep there are a lot of levers in the and, and a lot of buttons that we've just as we've yeah. discussed earlier. but it does put a, it does put a lot of work on the dm and on the players the game mm-hmm. does not do very much work for you no and mm-hmm. it does set up a bad power die that is frequently abused and that's where mm-hmm. a lot of the problems in mm-hmm. D&D stem from right mm-hmm. right a lot a lot of problems in the hobby in general yep. <laughs> because yep. it, it it is the hobby stuck around in a lot of other games it yep. sure did uh yeah. throw, throw some collaborative world building in there and that'll fix a, a good amount of that yeah. power dynamic and then oh, uh I've been playing and more of those lately yeah you, you you gotta you gotta involve the players or in everything that's going on because you know, that meta knowledge is going to be kind of gold for for going forward without having all these things devolve into it's a game of numbers. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Like I can't read a uh, second edition Pathfinder because there's too many tables and too many options. And I feel like I have to go through it. It's just a convoluted book and I can't handle it. <laughs> but I do still very much love the idea of like having your core class and then having your point by abilities where it's just like, you, yeah. You didn't level up yet, but also here's a thousand feats and they're all minor and they're all things like I can go to a party and make friends with the other soldiers. I can walk into a restaurant mm. and they'll recognize me as a critic and then we will get better yeah, service. Yeah, they're useful storytelling sure. yeah. things. Sure, mm-hmm. but like you read through those. Like I read through a 3.5 book recently, yeah. The Sunless Citadel, because I was I was prepping for a podcast edit. And like at the very beginning oh, of yeah. the book, in the intro, they talk about you walking through this field towards the town on this little winding road. And the description literally says, and then you walk past one die six plus three abandoned shacks. <laughs> they expect you to roll for the one die three abandoned shacks so you could randomize the amount of useless abandoned shacks that no one will go into <laughs> just so your players can feel like they're fully immersed Which in your fantasy. I'm sorry, I'm sorry. Just because the only wow. reason to have shacks is to have the players go, into, go them. into them. And if they're right. randomized, I, 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 it yeah, means like, the contents you... of the shacks aren't set, which means implicitly There's in no, D&D there is nothing in those shacks, which means it yep. is extra garbage. They told you to roll one die six plus three Hollywood fronts of shacks. Yeah. 
to okay, set the tone. Okay, but I as a player am definitely <laughs> going in there. Right, because as soon as you have to roll them, it draws your attention in a way that it shouldn't. Right? right? There's so much of that at all d But that goes back to that whole, like, r- don't roll if nothing happens. Exactly. Even if you roll it ahead of time, it guarantees that the DM is going to describe them. And one of the worst habits in D&D is if the DM says it, it's important. Right. Mm-hmm. If you say, and you walk past four empty shacks, immediately the adventure is now derailed. Yep. Right, because now in my head I'm like, I cast are shatter. Empty, why are there four why empty there shacks? <laughs> yeah, why are I they empty? St- I want to speak with some animals. Let's get a story think here. about this shack. Yeah. <laughs> right, right. Yeah, yeah. But mm-hmm. again, that's it's one of those, like, the, the rules are not, the rules in the books are not the games we're playing. They're right. just not. Yeah. And <laughs> right. it's very extremely frustrating to me when people are like, oh, I love d and I'm like, but do you? But do you? Do you really? Or do you love your version? I, like, I get that you love the game that you're playing. Yeah. That's great. And I'm super happy for you. But I don't think you love D&D. Yeah. I love Calvin Ball, too. But it took a long time for us to get here from baseball. Like, right. <laughs> you know, we made up all these rules, guys. Right. Right. <laughs> So on on that note about like m- making up your own rules and all that kind of stuff, what is the most uniquely interesting thing that you have seen in a game of D&D? Whether it was a choice a player made, something that you did, something you made up, something you read. What is like the thing that stood out to you that you were like, yes, this is good? So this is going to be one. This is not going to be one per- in particular thing, mm-hmm. but this is a general rule about this that makes that'll make every D&D game better. Right. OK. Every time I play a game of D&D, I want one person who knows the rules more than I do and is a little bit more of a DM than I am. I want them here. And on the opposite end, I want someone who's never played before. I want the new D&D player every time because they will do one thing that no one else will do. And it's ask the questions everyone expects a no to. They will ask things that everyone else has been geared to assume Mm. there's going to be a no or or at least the assumption of an expected no and therefore won't try. But that player will try every single time. Going back to D&D Live, I had Mm. a player at like first level decide to try and cast suggestion on an 18th level (laughs) character because they didn't expect the no no one else would have tried it and they didn't expect the no and that character rolled a one so they got it like sometimes it'll mm-hmm. work and no one else would have gotten you there unless it was a brand new player and to, mm-hmm. and i like those situations when they do things that nobody else would think to do because they're like this is D and this is what we do in D and exactly i like it when i when i run games for my kids um, because they just like, they don't have those like limits on their imaginations and like what you can do. So it's just like, I'm going to do this. And you're like, okay. Yeah. Uh, I always go back to like, I, the first time I ran no thank you evil for them. It was like this party scene or whatever. And my son's like, can I tell you what's in the buffet? And I'm like, yes. go for it. And he's like, there's blue jello. And there's like, he's listing all of these things. And I'm like, awesome. Like yeah. that is now important to your story that there is blue jello. <laughs> <laughs> like, but you just don't. You know, mm-hmm. as as adults and people who have gamed forever, we're like, yes, when I go into d and I'm like going to look around for this thing and I'm going to, you know, like you just don't, there yeah. are questions you don't even bother to ask because you're I like, that's not the important. Buffet, I search the buffet table for traps. Everyone's like, no, I just walk up to the buffet table. Who is this weirdo searching for traps right, everywhere? Right, and you're <laughs> like, I lift up the, the tablecloth because I want to see like what's underneath the table. And who you know? are you? Be at a like, party. Yeah. <laughs> right, but you know, it's like people who just... They're like, okay, I can do anything. I'm going to do anything then. Yeah. Whereas mm-hmm. the rest of us are like, oh, I can do anything. I guess I'll hit it with a sword. Mm-hmm. Like, <laughs> I can do anything. Here's my checklist of things I always do. <laughs> right. Yeah. Right. Yeah. I love playing with new people. It's so much fun. Okay. <laughs> Absolutely. This is, this is a two-parter. First okay. thing, uh, player death sucks unless it's going to be re- like player character death, obviously. Player death is tragic. Uh, <laughs> well, player death is it's real bad. <laughs> Does that happen to you a lot? Um, <laughs> well, it depends how annoying they get. And oh. what you got? <laughs> He's threatened several times. And yet Aram is still around. <laughs> Somehow I'm still We record online. Thing, yeah, it's, I'm it's only because alive. the whole like Canada, America thing is like really tough. For a long time, that border was shut down. Yep. Otherwise, <laughs> I would be gone. Uh, only his side of the border has guns, which is really the best way to line this one up. Uh, (laughs) But so a PC dying at any point sucks. 
But one of the rules I set out with my parties when I run home games is if we enter a situation where we're fighting a goblin horde and you go down and the die roll is bad and you would die, unless you think that is like a cool moment and you want to do a new character, obviously you can opt in. Our baseline is you don't die, but I own you now. Mm -hmm. Now we get to wait until there is a cool moment when it would be thematic. And that's the thing that opens the door to things like the villain stabbing you in the back and you act it actually matters yeah because right. mm -hmm. yeah 20th level party walks in and it turns out that the king has been stringing him along the whole time and he puts a sword through the back of the wizard the weakest member of the party and you roll a d8 and add three and you're like and you take 11 points of damage and the wizard turns around and goes i cast disintegrate yeah. nope that moment doesn't work but now you have this thing where you can immediately be like no 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 and for this this is when it pays off and the player gets it because it was foreshadowed because they knew mm -hmm. from that moment like uh, borrowed time something's coming yeah also players love to conspire right with the DM. that's the second yeah. oh, that's yeah. the second half you of feel that special because mm -hmm. that is the most effective thing to do at the start of a fight so the other thing you always have to make sure you do is give them a lieutenant yeah and bring that player on yeah. side because mm. no one at the table is going to be crueler to your players than your players 100 <laughs> percent. so when the wizard finally reveals his master plan and in the process of it just smites the paladin the golem he just animated here you go paladin destroy yeah. them yeah mm -hmm. go 100 percent. so much yeah. yeah. more fun yeah, whenever you like, get to put players in different bodies, they can't wait to tear each other apart. No, I think player death, like, it, it needs to be... It needs to be warranted. ...meaningful, because there's nothing worse than just, like, okay, and you, you know, like, I, I, I yeah. you know, I took damage, I took damage, I took damage, I took damage, and, like, because of my roles, I just, you know, yeah. like, yeah. kind of fell apart. Um, it is, feels awful. And so right. giving players the choice to say, like, is this moment narratively meaningful is this the moment where you want to go down mm -hmm. and like sacrifice yourself for your group you know yeah. like yeah. give them one more round to do that then if they want to yeah it failed my perception roll and missed the trap that sprung a fireball that killed me yeah, yeah that's the worst that, uh, that's, that's the what? worst way to go yeah yeah <laughs> yeah it really is. and then because there's that threat it just creates this this way of play where like we have to go into a room and check every door and listen at the yeah. door. Do we get our listen rolls done? Do we? And it's just like it adds all this time onto like it. it yeah, it's, because it's no player now crawls. is going to do anything. Tedious. Right? Like they're going to be so afraid mm -hmm. to do anything because they don't want that to happen to them. Too. We're going into the we're oh we're going into the trap hole. Okay, well let's all roll for the for the trap yeah. hole, and then that's how you play the thing. Yeah, and that's yeah. how I I found I, I started playing uh, Baldur's Gate three recently, and I I am playing that way like. I, I walk one person forward and they get a perception roll and it dice rolls above their head and it says, failed your perception roll. I immediately pull them back, yeah. pull in the next character right. to do the exact same roll with guidance. So that way I have a better chance of succeeding at this. Because uh, like, you know there's a checkpoint. Yeah, yeah. And, and I do that with all four characters. If, if I don't succeed, then I reload the game yeah. because I'm that annoying of Have a Have you plate. tried turning it off? <laughs> yeah. Well, he did. He turned it off and then turned it right back yeah. on. <laughs> and then I and then I succeeded my role because it's all my random. My gamer strats. <laughs> and then and so now, you're not now having I've fun? Got, now yeah. I've got sick games in Baldur's Gate 3. It's fine. I've <laughs> reloaded. I've, yeah. I've, I've, I've rage reloaded XCOM 2 so many mm -hmm. times I can't even possibly. Because we'll also because I'll name my characters after like literally after my friend. Yeah, yeah. So they'll so like Dylan. Well, Dylan can die. But other ones <laughs> need to come back. I can't lose Amelia. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> yeah, a hundred percent. Save every turn, yep. every action, yep. and and if no. it succeeds, keep going. Save it, I, and uh, if it uh, fails, okay, reload. Amelia, right? you're shaking yeah. your head, but I want to call out when you're talking about a D and D video game. It's a pre-written plot that you have no say in. If I fail an action in a narrative thing that we're all doing together and we're making up a story as a result of that, sometimes that's the mm -hmm. most interesting thing that happens. When I know yeah, that I'm right. coming into a boss fight in a little bit and the game won't progress until I win the boss fight and I walked through a trap and because the random number generator said so, I lost a third of my health. No, garbage. Try again. Do not yep. want. To. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Yeah, I suppose that is the difference. Yeah. Is like, am I making like active decisions or are things happening yeah. to me? Mm -hmm. Look at it this way. Don't look at it as resetting. Look at it as you're 
you are caught in a Groundhog Day time loop. And this is just the <laughs> one loop. I'm just loop. shaking my head more because like, how is this fun? Like, why are you playing? This doesn't even sound fun to me. Right, like, right. I just doesn't even sound fun it to does. me. So we, we I guess play like, for the cinematics lot, and the romance. It's yeah, fun. Also, also, lots of games are about micromanagement that are tons of fun. So this yep. is just another version. That's true. <laughs> That's true. I guess, yeah. I don't know. Uh, it's, it's, just it's, not... it's literally that eighth type of fun that we talked about on our type of fun episodes. Yeah. That that's not in the actual tabletop role playing. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. So, so yeah. I yeah. Mean, that's submission it, type. Yep. 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 Yeah. Mm, yeah. No, thank you. Yeah. Grind me into the dirt fun. Uh huh. <laughs> yeah. See, like I don't like. I just don't like grinding. I just well, don't. I can't yeah. do it like Elden Ring stuff. Like I can't yeah. do stuff where I just get. Nobody even Destiny. Literally... I stopped playing because it was like if you don't play all the time, like then you're right. under leveled, and I just don't want to spend all of my time doing the same thing over and over to get up to the level that I need to be. At. Like no. I, once, yeah. yeah. Once I, I am gr- a grown woman with so much time in my day. <laughs> there was That's a not period of time when I needed my Warcraft friends. Once I had. Right other friends and was doing other things right. warcraft is kind of a big huge drag on your time mm-hmm. right yeah. yeah i mean and that's and that's the thing is like for some people that is their kind yeah. of fun. like they Which have a great. great time with that yeah. awesome not for me right mm-hmm. it's it's i can so normally this is where we talk about the history of the game but we already did that like four years ago um, sure so i mean <laughs> it hasn't changed it hasn't yeah. changed no. much no, um, the history is still the history yeah, yeah. But we're we're seeing a lot more supplements kind of nowadays than than I I remember at least uh, growing up. I mean, there was a lot of you know three point five supplements that you know you go to a game store and there's like probably a hundred different official D and D books that you could just grab. Like, yeah. oh, I I want everything about a monk, so I'm just going to grab the monk subclass book or something. Yeah. You know, ridiculous like that. But here's the know, furthest left coast of the sword coast. Here's a whole yeah, book yeah, about yeah. it. Yeah. <laughs> but 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 now we're we're getting supplements like uh you you can play Stargate in 5e. You can do all this other stuff in, in the 5e framework and stuff. And um No, you can't. <laughs> you, you you can. can. Should should you? There right. we go. That's yeah. that's an argument. I I a hundred percent agree. Um, so yeah, it's, it's interesting that we're kind of seeing this, um, uh, almost, uh, I, I hate to use the word renaissance of like games being created using this framework, but there, there's a lot of things yeah. that you can, you can add on and, and we're going to demonstrate that a little bit coming up soon, uh, because I found the, <laughs> the perfect the worst. Uh, race for my character. Uh, mm-hmm. uh, Perfect. Absolutely. Okay. But we'll get that. Um, <laughs> all I'm saying is, uh, you know, the history of D&D, it's evolving. Yes. It, there is a lot of content being made around one system that makes it a universal thing so it can all interact. And that is a singular thing that hasn't happened before. That Like, that's the highest concentration of that. Apple. They can say the same thing. It's a wall. So, yes, it is a very pretty walled garden that mm-hmm. is being made right now. Yes. And, does it, and is it a very nice walled, you know, a garden to make certain games in and therefore having a large pool of people that can then buy your games? Mm-hmm. And it's very easy to say it's the sci fi version of D&D. It's yeah. the Western version of D&D. And it's all compatible. And it's all compatible. It's all None of it is compatible. compatible. Stop putting it in the <laughs> But hang on. Hang no, on. no, it is compatible. You it's can compatible. It uses it, the same kind of dice. It does, yeah. Come on, Dylan. So it, so it does. You it has can, the little 5E on the cover. It's compatible. Yeah. I'm going to just yes. be over here being you grumpy. That. You can say that. But Dylan's right. It's all Usually. like you have to do so many things to get there. You have to make so many concessions, build so many bridges when you could just say, just play D&D for D&D, pick up this other thing. And that's actually probably a better gaming ecosystem. And yeah. it also makes you a better gamer because it makes you think in ways differently. It makes you compute the math differently. It makes you get to the same solutions in different ways. So you're a better storyteller. Yeah. I have to say that I think that that Apple analogy is is good, though, as someone who just switched back to an iPhone from Android. And I've been te- I've been texting my friends who have had iPhones all along because um, I used to have one. And then I'm like, hey, I can't figure out how to do this. 
and they'll go, okay, well, if you go in here and do this and you switch, you know, like use the shortcuts thing. And then if you get picture, like you can change. It. And I was like, I can't just like reskin it. Like you have to do it each individual thing. Yeah. And then I was like, how do I get the icon icons to not be all up at the top of the screen? Well, if you get this app, then you can get like a blank box or whatever that'll push them to. And I was like, but on Android, it just had a grid and I just slotted them in wherever I wanted. Yep. No, you can't do that. Nope. I, I want to do this. Well, you can get an app and you can go over here and to do this, to make it compatible. And I was like, but why can't I just get, and it's like, well, if you want to do that, just get an Android. Yeah. Like just get the thing that's meant to do yeah. that, yep. you know? Yep. Um, but everybody else has the iPhone. And so now I can do the little reactions when my sister texts me and I, you know, like I, we're speaking the same language now when yeah. I do that. Yeah. So that way it's more convenient. No, it's and absolutely it like, it's the 100%. bit of this that always becomes frustrating is I have a great deal of respect for all the people doing this design work because it is right. good design work, but also it feeds. You're working in a bad framework. Yeah, you're, you're trying to build something from the ground up in a system that does not want it to fit in. Something that is meant mm -hmm. for, like, take the example I went with. When there's with. already a thing over here that's doing it better. Yeah, right. But that's the That's the part that frustrates thing. me, is like we're taking away from the thing that already does it better. And then it's a problem yeah, They're just going to get more locked into this. Because, again, they're building for databases now. When you show it, up, you're like, oh, look at this glut of material. D&D &D must really be mm -hmm. able to do everything. So you have these players yep. who are inundated with the idea of like, no, no, no. Star Wars is a D&D &D game. Well, you know, mm -hmm. horror is a D&D &D game. Like, mm -hmm. but <clears throat> just please, please. Conflict conflict has... is a D&D &D game. That's what they're trying to sell. Yeah. Please continue designing cool games and trying to slot them into whatever framework you want. There is nothing wrong with doing that. But also, please, for the love of God, support the designers that are building the experiences yeah. you're trying to have without yeah. right. no, no, there is, square peg there, round hole. Right. There, there is something to say, though, about system mastery, right? right? Like, like if, if mm -hmm. d is the thing that you know, you, you know the rules like the back of your hand. And you want to play sci-fi, but you don't want to learn another set of rules. You don't want to go to a different system because it might feel weird or your GM's not used to running right, anything aside right. from D&D. Now you've got options. And, and that's yeah, kind of cool. I, I get yeah, that. I, mean, I, I do think that there's it. a level of like privilege yeah. involved in like finding a new system because you do have to buy new books and you do, you know, whereas yeah. like. Not that you don't have to in D and D, but like they're they're supplements instead of core I mean, books, it's the, you know, mm -hmm. sometimes. And yeah, like there is a cognitive a load involved in learning a new system, yeah, though. And like mm -hmm. as somebody who like spends a ton of time reading new games, like it it takes it a toll. It's hard to it do. Does. And then you ask a group of like six people right. to do that, or you um, have to yeah. recreate that D and D experience of like, okay, this is a relatively complicated system, but I'm the only one who's going to learn it. And then I'm going to teach it to you right. over the course of three sessions. And yeah, right. Oh, so and so right. And to get every person to buy into that. Yeah. And yeah. And even if you are planning on using it as a writer, as a gamer, as, as someone who's making these games, if you're using D and G as the core analogy, because because that's what everyone understands. Even if you even if you're going to write something else, it'd probably behoove you to think, how can I make this work in D and D? Okay, how can like I take some of those wise, lessons? Right. Even. Yeah. And then how can I take some of those lessons and then make this game using what I've learned trying mm -hmm. to make this work in D and D? It's a good mm -hmm. exercise if it is. nothing else. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I will say as somebody who has like role playing games like somewhere in their dating profile, the number of times I've had to explain to people, like, no, not D and D. No, you can't. No, there's a better game to do that. Like, n no. Yeah. And they're Somewhere like, let me explain, in but in profile, my D and I. Your hinge audio is that. <laughs> right. Yeah. It's like, it's me just being like, it's not D and I did have to take that out because it was too many characters. Like I had in there, it was like RPGs, not D and D. Um, but I did have to take that out and I regret it. <laughs> you just but. used an exclamation point before the D and D and now you're writing programmers. Right. Speak, and it's fine. Right. Um, <laughs> but yeah, like the number of times people are like, let, but let me tell you about my D and D game and me being like. That sounds like this game. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It would do that better. Mm -hmm. And then they don't want to go on dates with me. Because <laughs> you would rush their perception of reality. Yeah. I know. I know. That's what it is. But it's a real good test because if one of them gets through that, you know, right. you filter, then they're good to go. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Right. <laughs> Can we just do a quick run through of like the basic terms and concepts we might need to know because we're going to talk about races and classes and subclasses and yep. things like that so sure. if you can give us a quick rundown okay which one you want to take this or am i taking this 
Uh, is it a rules okay, thing? Good point. So, uh, <laughs> <laughs> don't you like run a game like regularly I ask all, him the time, that all the like, time? Like, and he doesn't people? get better yes. at it. You know, Dylan's been involved. I've not gotten better. No. Just people like me. It's also oh, baffling. Yeah. Um, <laughs> so, base level. Uh, races is a bad term to use. It's your species. Are you going to be an mm-hmm. elf, a halfling? What sort of background did your character come from? Coincidentally, there's also the background. It gives you extra proficiencies. No one ever uses them for anything. Uh, they're effectively meaningless the way the game is currently designed. You have your class, which is what you do. So really, there are the two things that matter. Your species, which is who you are. Your class, which is what you do. Mm-hmm. Then when you start describing the character themselves, you have your base six stats. Your strength, dexterity, constitution, intelligence, wisdom, and charisma. Just the different facets of your abilities. Uh, they give you the number that you add to the die when you want to figure out if you did something right. You get a mm-hmm. list of skill proficiencies, and if you were proficient in a skill, it means that you add more numbers to it. There's a bunch of skills. Most of them don't get used. Uh, after that, you get your class abilities, which are the things that your class says you can do. You get your feats, which are better and more interesting every single time. Uh, mm-hmm. And then there's hit points and armor class. And hit points is how hard it is to kill you or how long it takes to kill you. Armor class is how hard it is to kill you. If you have, arm, hard, if you have a high armor class, it's hard to hit you. If you have a lot of hit points, yes. I have to hit you a lot to make you go down. And that's the Indiana nutshell. Did you do saving throws? Saving throws are like skills, but for not getting murdered. Oh, not getting <laughs> murdered is an important skill. It is. <laughs> but it's not one skill, it's, it's several, several skills. skills. Perfect. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I got Amazing. it. Yep. That's like the one rule I know. Yep. Don't <laughs> die. If you die, don't your die. character will be dead. Yep. And oh. the points don't matter anymore. All yep. right. Okay. And you might end up as a ghost that's haunting your zombie body. I would like so that to happen. Really I, want to write, I want to write that. Yeah. <laughs> I want to write right. it so like they're like they're like attached to a pendant that the zombie yeah. wears. Mm, yeah. Absolutely. That's good. We we've got the history. We've got basic terms and concepts. Uh, are we ready to make some people? Let's do it. I think so. Let's make some people. Let's make yeah. some Let's people. Let's make some people. Yeah. Let's make some people. Excellent. Very nice. It's good job. All right. So, uh, we're we're doing this one a little differently. Um, we've hinted at it quite a few times throughout the episode so far. We're we're all pulling in character options from different sources. Um, uh, Dylan might be making the most normal, quote unquote, D and D character here, but we'll see. I'm going on a steep gradient where I have some small picks from some of the weird books, and I'm going straight back <laughs> into the player's handbook because that's where the best things live. Amazing. Okay. So, so we've got a whole bunch of supplements between us that we're just kind of pooling together, and we're we're gonna see kind of what character options we throw out there. And then we're we're gonna kind of see what sort of world these this this party would exist in. Yeah, I'm so really I, excited for that part of like I, how do I, we yeah. how do we make this work? <laughs> this is gonna be a lot of fun because uh, uh, I I I was put onto this this uh, Tales of Arcana Five E Race Guide, um, which has like over 400 different uh, races that you can choose from. Um, I'll, I'll, I'll save my pick that for last. That is so but, specifically uh, not for me. Like, there are so many people that would love that book. I, I I'm not knocking it yeah. in the slightest, oh. but that is so very much not um, my deal. Yeah, it's definitely, it, it's, it definitely, like, changes yeah. the tone depending on what you're doing, a you know? A million percent. I mean, we started this like, off with, they, I would got, love to streamline this to fit a more specific thing. 400 distinct yep. cultures. <laughs> yeah, so I went to a random page, Angel Elf. Elf angel, oh, and so then uh, and then I went to another one, and there is a race called flatulent. Yeah, um, uh, and that then, is what Aram is going to pick because uh, it's close to a flump. Yet another one, uh, Krampus. You can oh, play a yeah. Krampus. Play Krampus. You, you no, can play not a Krampus. Santa. I wanna, I um, no, they've got, they've got Sasquatch in not here. The same. Yeah, not um, the same at all. Like a dog. The, yeah, Just like so, how that's like Santa. Yeah. So I'm gonna be picking my <laughs> my uh race from this book because it's it's 
phenomenal. I could not pass up the uh, opportunity. But there's a lot of amazing options. You could play a skeleton. Fun. You could play. You could play a slasher like character, like like Jason Voorhees type. Cool. Uh, like. This is wild. Yeah. You know, you could build that with so, a human yeah, it's gonna, a feet, right? And this is all in, like, one book. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Like, this is one book that has just, like, tons of options. I'm, I'm really into it. Um, just saying, variant The accessibility is, like, not the greatest in the book, but, like, seriously, it's, it's, it's good, and I'm going to roll with it, and we'll see what happens. Nice. Um, so, uh, what's, what's, what's everybody thinking? Well, I'm trying to, th- because like a bunch of these books have like one part, like this one has subclasses. So it's like, I need to build everything up to the subclass that I want to yeah. do. So I'm yes. going to have to pick different things from different mm. books and try to mash them together. Well, that's, that's nice. what I, I need to pick a class. So, like some well. of the books have, yeah. you know, everything all the way through. Um, but I don't know. I'm going to see Dylan, what are you doing? You seem to have like the clearest plan. He's going to make a nope. human f- nope. fighter. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> With both of his parents still living. Yep. Come on. They're really nice to him. Raised on a farm. The farm's doing great. <laughs> that's like the least D&D character I've ever Honestly, heard. that's a character <laughs> no, that I would be very, very happy to play. Uh, <laughs> the I played one orphan character once. And the story was specifically mm-hmm. dealing with the fact that he was upset that his parents were dead and we were kind of coming to terms with it. It was very fun. I enjoyed it a oh. lot. Actually, <laughs> it sounds like fun. Yeah, it was great. It's actually, uh, we'll talk later. It was, it was a whole thing. Yeah, it um, sounds nice. It does. So, it sounds very nice. Very I'm, awesome. I'm giving it myself does. some wiggle room to lean into the party as necessary. So I'm pulling from, uh, and Aram is going to scoff at this uh i'm gonna pull from dragon stew and i'm gonna take the baker background because that's funny scoff oh, amazing uh, much scoff i mean persuasion and athletics are awesome proficiencies to get out of that and the rest of it is yeah. just like you said it's cute and it's a skill that i feel like can come up a lot during the game like that's actually a really good thing to pull from i know i it's like fun. that yeah. one yeah that yeah. book is really cute mm. this is, i'm gonna look through this more later uh but Dylan just thinks that I hate food. No, you hate it when I talk about food. Yes. Uh, but yeah, if we're going to do a baker, we're going to do an orc cleric. Now, how I, how I tilt that is going to... I'm going to pull the orc out of Monsters of the Multiverse because that is a better stat block than the initial orc stat block that gave him, like, negatives to, I think, either charisma or intelligence or both. We're going to go from there. Amazing. Ooh. Okay. I oh. am playing a Loxodon. Named Johnny Sax. And Johnny Sax is a bard who plays their trunk oh. like a saxophone. Oh, I love it. Thank you. How do you already have a name? Johnny Sax. How did he come up with Johnny Sax? Johnny the, the elephant that plays his trunk like a Not sax? Not a saxophone. He doesn't. <laughs> Johnny Sax has a big white, like, like big shouldered, double breasted white coat. And a fedora. With this a is the worst thing you've ever seen. A flamingo said. feather. God. In fact, <gasps> in it. Flamingos are my favorite animal. Um, you know what? I'm here for you. Johnny Sachs this is, is here for you. in the Flump episode. Amazing. Amazing. How did you do that? I want to make something like super spooky. I'm already upset. Saxophone Absolutely. is not an option in the musical instrument drop down. <laughs> Make that up. All right. So if you got gnomes, you can get really? saxophones. Make it up. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. yeah. Is, is, you, I can find a supplement that's got what saxophones. What is the most saxophone like instrument out of these the, instruments? A, a, Do a they have a clarinet okay. in there? It's fine. Because. Mm, well, what is a song horn? Uh, that it sounds, sounds fictional. That's, that's, that's cool. Right? That's, that's song like a horn. Yeah, song yeah, yeah. horn. Any, any brass instrument is technically a song horn. Yeah. You know, saxophones are woodwinds, right? Shh. <laughs> yeah. There's also just horn. I guess I could have not a horn. taken that. It's That's a woodwind. True. It's not called a saxo horn. You're fine. Fine. Okay. There's also bird pipe, and bird pipe could be anything. <laughs> so I'm taking that. Bird pipe. I don't know. I have no it's idea. Bird bird call. Yeah. I, I got a whistle. Could That's be. my bard instrument. Yeah. <laughs> All right. So, um, I've only got my my race picked out so far. Uh, like I said, it's from Tales of Arcana, the 5e race guide. And I am going to be playing what is known as a Vroom Vroom. Mm-hmm. 
<laughs> this is literally a sentient car. Um, <laughs> so on board for this. I know. I'm so, so excited so, for this episode. I I want it. <laughs> so drew rooms are sentient automobiles from the realm of Motorheim, of course. <laughs> Motorheim. Uh, they, though they have inorganic ex- exteriors, internally they are organic with a skeletal structure, organs, and blood-like fluids. Ew. Um, yeah, born from a mother factory, Vroom Vrooms lived harsh lives, Aww. haunted, hunted by vile train creatures known as choo-choos. Uh, <laughs> few have been able <laughs> to make the journey to Arcana. Okay, so now, is there really choo-choos in this book too? I I know. Know. Right? I'll look. I'll look because they're all oh, in alphabetical goodness. order. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It is there a limit to how big your car can be? Um, size of uh, room rooms have the same dimensions as a real world car standing around five feet tall, between fourteen and fifteen feet long, and around six feet wide. They weigh around three thousand five hundred pounds. Your size is large. Could you be a tour bus? Ah, uh, that might be a little too big. Could you be a VW right, bus? Enough. Choo choos are not yes. in here. Your base walking speed is forty feet. Could you be a v- uh, like a like a VW bus though? Like the kind of could you be the kind of van that like a small band might that tour a around? Small in locally? elephant. Could I don't know. There's a lot of uh, there's a lot of options on here because like um, carburetor. Okay, it says rarity unknown. Even though automobiles <laughs> exist in industrial areas, your vroom vroom would be one of the first to leave the realm and arrive at Arcana. Um, so they have a passenger compartment. You can have um, terrible climber, of course. Sure, right. <laughs> <laughs> that would be a problem, <laughs> right? Um, unique appearance. Uh, Stairs appearance in general. Of, okay, so the appearance of each room room varies depending on what vehicle they are based on. You're encouraged to base your character on an existing brand, uh, or you can pick a more historical model if that better fits the campaign setting. Neither of those will fit sure. a campaign setting. <laughs> yeah, no, you're right. Um, so, yeah, your the room room might resemble a truck, SUV, or van, yeah. uh, which would change the appearance of your character, but has no game function. No, it's just like with Transformers. They just, they mm. just, they'd, as soon as the ship crashes, they scan the area and become yes. whatever's around them. Yeah. Um, uh, I, there, there is the variant of the, the room room as well. You could play a variant room room, which is... An actual sentientized car, so right? Uh, instead of so, it's a it's an awakened Taurus. It's an awake, <laughs> yes. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yeah. So, so I gotta figure out what, what type of car I'm gonna be. Do you make yeah. a car? Um, and if you I, make a druid, I am going I to make to it a rogue. I'm gonna I'm gonna make it a rogue because I want it to be a spy car. Okay. Okay. Yeah. 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 It's like a. It's got like gadgets and stuff. It's like a convertible. It's got a disguise kit. Or I guess it could go It's like an Aston right? Martin, is what it needs to be. Well, yeah. is it, that's true. But is it a fancy spy or is it like an FBI van spy? Like what kind of spy no, it's, is it? It's, it's like James Bond yeah. spy level car. Yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. It's an Aston Martin. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's like an Aston Martin. Like Martinis decked out in the with, dash. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So my long range bow attack is literally an arrow that shoots out the front or something, right? Perfect. Yeah. <laughs> Perfect. Uh, that'd be more skis. like a crossbow at that point, right? You do realize yeah. there's an entire class in the, or race in this book called Magical Girl, right? That's no. amazing. No. no. Starting over. <laughs> uh, Are you serious? Magical Page Girl is a class, not a race. No, I agree. Like I'm not saying girl. that you're wrong about what's okay, in the book. I'm that, saying but... the book is wrong. Okay. Yeah, so why, now, is ma- why is now major I have to flip through and see also if there's a class. There, there probably is. is. There probably is. Shh. I know. I'm going to play a sorcerer that does something with blood over here. Oh, there's a thing called Painbringer. That seems legit. <laughs> Magical girls are, this is for the age. Magical girls arise from adults. They can live as long as humans, but rarely survive past 30. That's dark. That's very dark. Though, by the end of yeah, some yeah, magical girl super stories, dark. like, they always start off fluffy pink rainbows. But by the end of some of them, like. <laughs> they get dark. Okay, yeah, so I know it's a little weird putting a thirty-year-old expiration date on a magical girl. Something yeah. about that doesn't just, sit right with me. Well, yeah. I mean, you, in all those magical girl shows, you never see you never like an get, elder. 
Magical You're girl. never going to get true. like a yeah, six-year-old transformation yeah. sequence and then they're like, I'm not going to join the fight, but I know I know. I would your love turn. a generation. I would love yeah. a That'd generational magical girl story That'd that like, like gra- grandma joins in. Yeah. Uh, like, name, okay, name one something last battle. more anime mm-hmm. than grandma who like, like can't do this anymore, can't come with you to fight the grand necromancer, but someone shows up and threatens the house and grandma just like, nope. Transformation time. Yeah, here mm-hmm. comes Gaia. Fantastic. Yeah. Hundred <laughs> yeah. exactly. percent. Okay. So I love I love that I could be a magical girl, but I gotta be a vroom vroom. You That's gotta fine. be a car. You can't you gotta be you, a car. You, you can't introduce being a car. You and can't then back and then not, and not be I, a, yeah. I just I just felt yeah. obligated to let you know. I appreciate that. Like I said, there's four there's over four hundred and fifty options in this book. And like it is so easy to just skip over like 450 of them yeah. and just hold it on a couple. You made like a sock puppet. Why? What? Yeah. Uh, you could be a, a bowl of ramen. But then they do have cool stuff like um, like different varieties of, you know, like uh, skeletons. But they also have like Oni and Orishas and um, just like all kinds um, of stuff. Wildly Slime disappointed cube. that the rogue crazy. archetype in Tasha's Crucible of everything else, uh, it's called Improviser, but it's about being a, a MacGyver and being able to create traps. And I was really hoping, oh. you know, that my rogue went through Second City. I feel like that's more of a bard thing. Yeah. I think you're right. Yeah. I think like an improv bard would be I'm pretty sure that's obnoxious, all the bards but do it. and it is obnoxious. All bards yeah, are obnoxious. It's just a baseline. I'm pretty so, sure there's a transformer in this book. Oh, there's gotta be. My elephant's name is Kenny G. <laughs> I thought it was Johnny Sachs. It was no, it should be Johnny Sachs. Is it Johnny Sachs or is it Kenny G? It has G? to be. You said Johnny, Johnny Sachs. Sachs. It's gotta it's be Johnny, Johnny Sachs. Sachs. Yeah. Johnny Sachs. It's gotta be Johnny Sachs. Yeah, Johnny Sachs is better. S A X X. No, S A C H X. S A wait S A C H S. Yeah, Johnny Sachs. I love Johnny. All right. Could be Sarah. Um, okay, th- so do I want to be a part spider person or do I want to be like a digital, um, a digigod? I mean, Ooh. both are pretty good. The but, digigod looks pretty yeah. cool. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Call to action. Yeah, like that. Uh, this episode, huh? Well, there's there's a lot of great discussion, honestly, at the beginning of this series. Um. Which which is great because that's this episode. Yeah. Um, but um, no, I, I mean, boy. I really enjoyed getting to sit down and talk to people who, you know, spend a lot of time both running this game and thinking about it yep. um, and, and talking to a variety of different people about it, too. That's mm-hmm. one cool thing about their show is that they they get to talk to people with all kinds of expertise oh, yeah. um, about stuff. And so the the sort of unique perspective that they have on this mm. game as opposed to me just being like five e you know and they're like okay but here's why <laughs> uh-huh, uh-huh. um it's it it really interesting it was a lot of fun yeah it, it was a lot of fun and um as you you probably have heard uh our characters are um they're something mm-hmm. uh <laughs> and, yep. and and it it, it it only gets more something from here. Yep. So. <laughs> yep. <laughs> so yeah, yeah. Uh, you, you definitely have to stay tuned for for next episode uh, next week because oh lord. It yeah, it goes places, but it was fun. You know, it was, it was, a, was fun. It was a lot it was, of fun. We were clearly having a great time, and honestly, as somebody who listens to podcasts, a lot of times that's just fun to listen to. Is just like people having a good time. Just pure chaos. Um, yeah, yeah. It was like, sometimes you don't want to because you're like, okay, where's the story? Yeah. Um, but we don't have a story, friends. So. <laughs> the, the story is the characters we made along the way. Yep. Hopefully, hopefully you enjoy it uh, as much as we did because we had a great time. Exactly. Before we let you go for the week, let's just do our calls to action. We'll try and be quick. We probably won't, though. We'll try to be brief. We'll it's fine. Uh, first, don't forget to submit your question to our Q&A. This is the uh, last call for questions. So we'll be recording this very soon. Uh, you can get those in at questions.charactercreationcast.com. If you are desperate to hear more from us, 
please consider backing the One Shot Network Patreon at patreon.com slash one shot podcast. You get access to the secret archive, uh, which has several episodes from us. I'm yep. not going to try and count how many. Um, <laughs> and a bunch of other shows on the network. You can watch that feed if you loved our Marvel episodes and want to hear our souls shatter just a little bit more. <laughs> so just a little more. Just, just yeah. a little bit more. <laughs> it's fine. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know what you're uh, into. <laughs> exactly. Uh, also, <laughs> also coming up on uh, Monday, May 16th is Miracle Monday. Uh, this is an event that Jeff Stormer is uh, going to be doing some superhero themed uh, stream up on the One Shot Network tw- Twitch channel. Um, so we, we teamed up with Jeff and John from System Mastery. Uh, to record an actual, actual play uh, that would be part of this uh, stream using the characters we created with uh, the Marvel superheroes uh, series back in series 49. Um, uh, please know that we're not going to play pl- Marvel. <laughs> I just want to put that out there. No. So if anybody's like, oh, I don't really want to like, yeah. we're recreating them in Sentinels, yep. um, which we also recorded with Jeff and John. So I promise it'll be at least moderately listenable. Yeah. So, uh, <laughs> Yeah, so it, it'll it'll be fine, um, and, and you know we're still sticking to it. We we created these characters in Marvel superheroes. We're still not playing the Marvel superhero version of these characters. It's true. We're so. we're we're squeaking by on this technicality, friends. <laughs> Very the, technical. The, these are not the characters we created. Did exactly. we like port them over word for word as much as we could? I mean, yes, pretty close. Um, Like, I technically have more superpowers than I did because I broke them down into parts Mm -hmm. because Sentinels wants you to be competent. Um, So it's thematically the same, the same types of powers. Uh, But it's not it's not the same. It's not the same. I probably got the most complex Sentinels character in all of history that probably breaks many of the rules of the game. Yeah. Just just to get 10 powers for a changeling with five forms. But it's fine. It's fine. <laughs> it's fine. It's fine. It's fine. Um, either way, uh, this stream will feature a lot of great superhero content and all in the name of getting donations to the Trans Lifeline charity, uh, which is definitely needed in this day and age. Yeah, um, more than ever. Absolutely. So uh, please tune in to that. Uh, it's just two weeks away from today. Uh, and and try to, to give a little bit to a really great cause, um, as well as be entertained for a while. Yeah. Yeah. I'm excited. Mm -hmm. I'm excited to see where this game goes because we haven't recorded it yet. Um, But then also uh, what everybody else brings to this because it's a it's a lot of cool people doing cool stuff. So absolutely. Uh, Still no reviews. So please, 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 please. We are literally begging you, please leave (laughs) us reviews. Uh, You can leave them on Apple Podcasts, Podchaser, Podcast Addict and Facebook. You could also join our Discord at discord.charactercreationcast.com and just tell us how great we are to our face. Yeah. Uh, that one doesn't help us as much, but, you know, it, I'll it still, still take it. It still makes us feel good. I'll still take it. Say it to my <laughs> face. <laughs> I, I don't think threatening the audience. <laughs> I mean, you shouldn't threaten the audience? Okay. You shouldn't threaten the audience. <laughs> Come in here and say it to my face. <laughs> tell me how great I am. Do it now. Yeah. <laughs> please uh-huh. uh, well that's it for our calls to action uh, thanks so much for sticking with us everyone uh, next week we will be finishing our characters uh, which is definitely a whole thing, that's that, a whole thing. that happened um, yep. until then have a good rest of your week uh, stay safe, drink some water loosen your shoulders, unclench your jaw uh, maybe wear a mask uh, vaccinate Uh, and keep making those amazing people. We'll see you next time. Thank you for joining us for part one of this character creation series. We'll be back in part two, picking up right where we left off. Character Creation Cast is a production of the One Shot Podcast Network and can be found online at www.charactercreationcast.com. 
head to the website to get more information on our hosts, this show, and even our press kit. Character Creation Cast can also be found on Twitter at CreationCast or on our Discord server at discord.charactercreationcast.com. I'm one of your hosts, Ryan Bolter, and I can be found on Twitter at Lord Neptune or online at lordneptune.com. Our other host, Amelia Antrim, can be found on Twitter at Ginger Reckoning. Music for this episode is used with a Creative Commons license or with permission from the podcast they originated from. Further information can be found within the show notes. Our main theme music is Hero Remix by Steve Combs and is used with a Creative Commons license. This podcast is owned by us under Creative Commons. This episode was edited by Ryan Bolter. Further information for the game systems used and today's guests can be found in the show notes. If you'd like to leave us a rating or review, we have links to various review platforms out there, including Apple Podcasts, in our show notes. Also, check the show notes for links to our other projects. Thanks for joining us. And remember, we find that the best part of any role-playing game is character creation. So go out there and create some amazing people. We will see you next time. We gotta read some show blurbs. Show blurbs. Show blurbs. Show blurbs. Show blurbs. Character Creation Cast is hosted by the One Shot Podcast Network. If you enjoyed our show, visit OneShotPodcast.com, where you'll find other great shows like Neo Scum. Neo Scum is a narrative comedy podcast featuring five Chicago improvisers antagonizing their way through the role playing classic Shadowrun. It follows a group of misfits and outsiders. Z, the acerbic cyber troublemaker. Pox, the candy junkie klepto from across the pond. Tech Wizard, the public access actor with a petulant thirst for adventure. And Dak Rambo, the nastiest trucker this side of the Robo Mason Dixon. Join the irascible Neo Scum crew on a puerile rockin' road trip through a weirdo world of tomorrow, doling out street justice to every deeb they encounter, whether they deserve it or not.